You like comics? You bet we do. How about artwork? Yeah, we fucking love that too. You like movies? Whether they are old or new. How about streaming? We watch that fucking shit, it's true. But it's comic book art that gets us all fired up for the all time great. So let's buckle up. Hear me out, I'ma tell you how it all goes down on the blacklist. Underground. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Blacklist Underground, brought to you by Ideal Organic CBD, starring our favorite artist, Zach Howard, creator of the hit series Wild Blue Yonder, as well as illustrator of The Cape, Hellboy, Judge Dredd, TMNT, and too many others to mention. I am your host, enthusiastic comic book aficionado, J.C. Washburn, and each episode we choose a comics legend to ink a comic book panel of, and this week's giant who's getting blacklisted is none other than Frank Frazetta. Without question, the most iconic fantasy artist of all time. And this week, we welcome Nick Rungi, whose painted covers span all of the major publishers and whose fine art is held in high esteem and in great demand among fans, galleries, and critics alike. Zach, would you hit us up with our Patreon blacklisters this week? Absolutely, sir. We got a, a mighty fine list of people today uh, that have blacklisted us on Patreon. The first one is Anthony DiGelonardo. And try and uh, uh, spell that name, and your eyes will fall out of your head. Uh, then we got Andrew Jackson Brown. Thank you very much, sir. My longtime uh, friend and fan, Philip Jean Pierre. And then over in Europe, we got Olga Masia. Kurt Kroll is another one, which I wish it was spelled with a U, and he came with the little Kroll star. That'd be pretty cool. But uh, we don't get that yet. Steve McKay, thank you. And last but definitely not least, Patrick McNerney. Oh, there you go, Patrick. We love you. And Nick, just so you know, every week we like to start off with a quote from the artist. Um, you've actually met Frazetta, right? I met uh, Elliot Frazetta, his wife. Um, it was in 2008. I went to the museum, so it would have would have been nice to meet Frank, but I totally understand. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is, this is, um, this is, I, I've been researching Frank this week. I do it every week. I do a little research on the artist and I try to find, you know, a, a quote that kind of sums them up. And I, this one kind of struck me. He says, I don't want to paint just another painting. It's something important. You want to look at it maybe forever. Who wants to look at just an ordinary hero forever? You want the ultimate. You pull out the stops and do everything in extremes. The extreme in beauty, if it fits. The extreme in ugliness, if it fits. The extreme in terror, if this is what's required. You know, I think this is just one reason that so many people enjoy my stuff, because all the extremes are jammed into it. And um, I thought that kind of sums up Frazetta. I would agree, yeah. It does, he does the iconic version of anything he paints. Um, and it really is his anatomy knowledge and just the, I think his physical knowledge of the world um, really does allow him to get it perfect, that perfect snapshot that everybody talks about um, when they talk about his work. And I think it's so difficult, in my opinion, to be able to make something so realistic and dynamic at the same time, because it's almost impossible. Um, you have to have so much imagination to get it to that point. But then it does look, they're like photographic, but he just, he knew it so well and he could just imagine the lighting that it's frustrating, you know, as an artist, but it's really inspiring. <laughs> yeah, it is frustrating, Nick. It's just, it's, he, he found that lightning in a bottle. And I think I like how you describe it as it's almost a photo, but you know, it's not, mm -hmm. you know, obviously because it's fantastical and, and every, I don't know. He's one of the guys that, just found that magic formula uh, somehow. Um, and yeah, it angers me too, because I suck and he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nick, I've, um, I've pulled up on the screen your, um, this, is the, this is you painting at super high speeds, a uh, Frazetta image. Oh, cool. Um, Zach, did you choose the image, Zach? I did. I chose a horse and then two guys fighting. Uh, a famous uh, watercolor he did, I believe, uh, is the one that Nick is doing. And I printed them out in super, super light gray tones for Nick, uh, like they were loose pencils. 
so he could uh, have fun with them, as opposed to me where I have this, you know, really dark blue line. It wouldn't look too great uh, if Nick was forced to work with cyan as a palette. Solid cyan. (laughs) (laughs) It might be something interesting, you know, but yeah, if you're going to go so dark and bring so much depth to it with the ink that it's got to be pretty dark. Even when I was painting on top of it, you know, this is a good thing I had two copies of it and had it on the screen to reference because, yeah, it's he suggests so much with so few lines that I, I'm so glad you picked that one because it's one of my favorites. Just again, frustrating that you know, by that point in his life, his anatomy knowledge was just so natural, even for horses, too. That's an entire new universe, it's not even people, but it was so natural that just the compared to some of the pen and inks that I love with the Tarzan uh, series. They have so much going on that it's a whole different challenge. But with these, it's so minimalistic, but he suggests so much of that line that if I would lose any of it when I was painting, I'd have to look at, at the other reference just to kind of get me back on track. And that's always the the difference is all the work and planning and things I have to do to like half acid. And then, you know, he's doing it at an ultimate level just from his mind. But you know, if you draw that many comments, comics, and yeah, it's insane. So I think after a while, you just, you get it down, but he got it at such an insanely quick rate that that's what I think scared the shit out of everybody. And and I love it. He's a scary individual, you know, like he's, he's He's a great, a great father. You can see that on the documentary. He's a sweetheart, but at the same time, like, don't mess with him, you know, (laughs) school school. I like his, uh, oh, sorry, JC, just real quick, uh, uh, quick little uh, uh, tag along there is his self-portrait. The store, I have a little book where with like a lot of his paintings in it and he discusses them. And he was talking about uh, uh, his self-portrait, that famous like intense one that he has mm-hmm. and how it came about. He was like pissed and he said he literally ripped fence posts off like a fence and then like walked into the house and just painted what he saw. But uh, I always thought that was hilarious. <laughs> he literally was just ripping nailed pickets to a fence off in, in frustration <laughs> and then went and painted himself. So, uh, I mean, uh, imagine yeah, it, if you were the person who went out and was like, Hey, that crazy guy is tearing my fence up. You're and you realize your like, in your bathroom. Yeah, it's <laughs> one of those, like, like, comes in, starts ripping your pickets <laughs> off your fence. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Yeah, you're like not going to be like, oh, that's that's one of the great masters of painting. You're going to be like, that's a <laughs> lunatic, you know. And then he goes and paints that portrait that's so beautiful and just so frank. I mean, literally, uh, play on words, you know. <laughs> and and he could afford to he could actually afford to fix a fence, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, probably at the point he painted that, that was the frustration of being a master in comics and then the fifties happened and the comics got shut down by the code and all that. And all the great horror comics just had to kind of disappear. And so like you said, in the documentary, he's like, I thought everybody would be waiting to hire me. And it was old fashioned at that point, comics had changed. And um, to think of all that knowledge you have and all that skill, and then you have to go back home and wonder if you're going to be able to pay the rent or whatever, pay for, I don't know what was happening at that point in his life, but I think that was, the mid sixties when he started to, to paint with the oil paint. And I do love the evolution of the watercolor and then it gets more intense and more intense. And then it starts, you start seeing these oil paintings that look like watercolors. And then all of a sudden they just get this classical look um, that you could put in a museum with Michelangelo or something, you know, even that the crazy subject matter, I think people get hung up on the subject matter, but it really does transcend illustration. I agree, man. You guys had Go mentioned Jason. you guys had mentioned horses. Check out this. I mean, look how, look how natural oh, it is. <laughs> Freak of freaks, man. Look at that yeah. palette too. So much well, energy. Just like, I'll, I'll use brown. <laughs> yeah, it looks like he took burnt sienna or burnt umber, and like that's just the underpainting. So you can imagine <laughs> how far he could take that. And it's like the underpainting has everything. So it's like, fuck. And he would, and he could, he could you know, he could do something like this and do like a very stylized, you know, version of a horse too. I mean, that's a muscular Conan mm-hmm. horse. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, his, his horses were, I think, as intense as the figures he drew. Um, Hell, the sky is as intense as the figures he draws. It, it's, it, he's truly able to put himself into every single brushstroke line, background, mountain, wave, uh, troll, ogre, 
it's just it's beyond interesting what this man could do with his work. Oh, um, I agree completely. And it well, seemed to be lacking the like the uh, to, uh, the kind of echo JC's point. You know, I feel the envy because the, this is so much labor for me, and I'm tracing the fucking guy uh, <laughs> for the most part. Uh, he's just so effing good. It, it, it's inspiring and kind of makes you feel weird at the same time. It's a, it, there's very few artists of any genre of uh, medium that can uh, evoke uh, this emotional, you know, kind of uh, juxtaposition in me. So I guess at least in my mind, I, he, he's one of the greatest of all time, just artist artists. I can't stop looking at his stuff and spend my whole oh, life. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and like how they they mentioned in the documentary how when you get better at painting or drawing or any kind of craft, some artists kind of kind of look ridiculous after a while, and it's kind of funny that I was so into it, but then Frazetta just continually frustrates me like even more and more because of the speed he did it. He, he's like Caravaggio. Caravaggio would paint those uh, masterpieces. I mean, he had models, you know, but he would paint those things in six hours or something, and so to do that same thing like without models. For the most That's part, insane. it's you know uh, different times. Yeah, he had a still. weird mind that that could just kind of it was making art math in his head rather than me trying to invent art. It just seemed like he was just a, a vehicle for getting it. Like his head was an antenna for the universe of creation or some shit. Mm -hmm. um, well, I have some old comics. The old um, when he was really look, really looked like Hal Foster because Hal Foster did such beautiful backgrounds and that was all from Hal Foster's imagination. He had one small tiny circular mirror in front of his face and that was it. So his wow. stuff, you know, you could say like, oh, it's a little more stiff than Frizetta, which it certainly is, but the fine quality of it. My my dad used to talk about waiting to get the Sunday comics in the fifties and sixties, um, mainly the fifties when he was a kid, to look at the uh, Hal Foster work. So you can see in the early Frank uh work that you know, the anatomy was like wonkier than it got, but it was always there. You could tell almost like overnight that he learned how this muscle was connecting to the bone and how, and it's funny because I looked up online, I thought like, well, what the hell? Like what book was he looking at that he was given? Um, yeah, what magic was, portal. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's the George Bridgman Constructive Anatomy. So it's yeah. really good. But to take that book that was made in 1920 and it has beautiful illustrations, don't get me wrong, but it's very very minimal and it's got everything you need but that's like saying it's got everything you need like an overhead projection until you put it all together kind of like an iron man and you see the suit all go together he could just do that in his mind in a few nights as like a 15 year old so <laughs> i sketch from that thing over and over and i go back now and i'm like god i still forget how this damn arm works and you can see in the comics i have a few issues of them where it just is improves and improves and improves inst like instantly so uh, he no. he ghosted Hal Foster for a bit, didn't he? I, I'm not sure if he actually ghosted Foster himself, but he definitely jumped in on a lot of books and did go. And I think they talk about, I think Neil Adams talks about that in the documentary. Little Abner or something like that. Or yeah, whatever. they're like, we didn't think he was working on it, but it just automatically looked four billion times better. <laughs> and so they suspected, you know. Um, <laughs> wow, this yeah. artist really improved today. <laughs> yeah. Nick, it's it's funny you should say you should mention that. I, I that's the exact quote that I read last night. Um, Pull it out, Frida. JC. Just do it right now. It's apropos. Yeah, it's well, a really good quote. This is this is a real quote, and this is probably the same one that you read. I guess his uh, his teacher's name was Ralph Mayo. He says when Ralph took over, he took me aside and said, "Frank, your stuff is great, but you need to learn some anatomy." Mm -hmm. So Ralph handed me an anatomy book. And when I went right. home that night, I decided to learn anatomy. <laughs> Started with page one and yeah, copied one the night. entire book. Everything in one night from the skeleton <laughs> up. I came back the next day like a dumb kid and said, thanks very much. Just learned anatomy. Of course, Ralph fell over and roared with laughter. Frankie, you silly bastard. I've been studying for 10 years. I still don't know anatomy. And you went home and learned it last night? But the thing was that I really had learned an awful lot. I had the ability to absorb things, and he saw an improvement in my work right away. It amazed him and that meant a lot to me. From that point on, I developed pretty rapidly. I started to do, to do things with figures that made sense. Awesome. Yeah, and to think that he just absorbed it like that. And I think it's almost like 
Frank's attitude is he's such a, a fighter, you know, like he's a sweet guy, but he's such a fighter that I think a little bit of encouragement or discouragement, like when he says in the documentary, he's like, they told me, don't ever, don't ever draw realistic. You're the best at this. Do the cartoon stuff. And he's like, that's some nerve, you know, <laughs> some yeah. nerve. And he's like, I went home and I started painting realistically. And so I think he just is like, he needs to either be egged on or like encouraged and one or the other. So it's really cool. And then it just, he hit the ground running. And it's fuel that goes yeah. in the fuel tank, positive yeah. or negative. Oh, exactly. He, I think he just he just didn't give a damn. He just wanted to play baseball. So it's almost like the ironic fucking universe being like, oh, you don't care? Well, just to make sure that we're sure about that, we'll make you the best artist ever. <laughs> yeah. Just to make sure you don't care about it. You know, you just want to play baseball because that's all he talks about is how oh, I could have played ball and I was just sitting around. It's like, oh, yeah, you're just sitting around. <laughs> yeah, I thought he could be pro. I remember him saying that in some interview that I read, I believe. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of my books, he thought he could be a pro ball player, which is pretty interesting. He probably could have. You know, I mean, his, his buddies back him up. They say he they say he had a hell of a swing and a wild man. You know, riding three wheelers and and doing popping wheelies and then painting Clint Eastwood paintings and then what an interesting man and that led an interesting life. According to Baxi, when they were filming Fire and Ice. Um, the actors weren't sort of living up to Frazetta's vision of, of how a barbarian should act. <laughs> and he yeah. was in his fifties, you know, he was, he was not a young man at that point. And they said that Frank was, was out. Uh, he was beating all of these young, you know, stunt men for pure athleticism and outperforming everybody, you know, in his fifties, all yeah. the stuff was, was rotoscoped. So the stuff you see in the movies actually rotoscoped, you know, that's Bakshi's thing, though. That's how he got around budget issues. And he actually, on Fire and Ice, it really comes together versus some of the other movies you saw him use rotoscoping, I felt. And it might have been the subject matter or or Frank's involvement or just an evolution of uh, Bakshi's technique of rotoscoping or everything combined. But uh, Fire and Ice is one hell of a beautiful movie, man. Oh, it really is. It's really pretty. And it's it's cool. It is cool to see. I do like the rotoscoping look, you know, and it's it's funny to think that Frank Frazette is involved in something where they're essentially tracing over pictures where he could just he is the pinnacle of the imagination, you know, but it, human yeah, rotoscope. They, yeah, exactly. He was a human rotoscope. He just closes his eyes. And it's like in front of him. <laughs> But yeah, I love that Bashki quote where he's running, like Frank comes running down the hill, and leaps onto the branch, and then they're at the same time in the documentary, they're showing the, the clip from the movie. He's like, yeah, we can't do that, you know? <laughs> and he's like 59 or something. So yeah, it, uh, I know that that translated into his art. It's just he knows how the muscles work, and he knows the intensity. Like, he is those characters. So I think he just brings that into his paintings. Yeah, definitely his personality's in there, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of brash and bombastic and somehow just works because usually those brash, bombastic people, their styles are kind of a, a one-note <laughs> joke. Yeah. You know, it's just the same crap over and over again. And they invest in their personas more than they do their art where Frazetta was a, a, a true, unique, per you know, one of these artists that stand out in time, I think, because of his personality, his execution, mm -hmm. uh, talent level, you know, all, it was just a weird combination of just <laughs> unbelievable talent, the right personality and the right timing, you know, just mm -hmm. all came together to make this just immutable genius. But, you know, and, oh, yeah. and also just his, his design, his ability to design, like no two book covers were alike, you know, like, Check, I mean, check out this one. Mm -hmm. This Godmakers. I mean, oh, it's, oh my God. It. I love that one so much. I, I came across this one along I, with along with the um the prelim that he had done for it and, and some other stuff. But I mean insane. I was looking through his his um his old book covers and I I was like, you know, this he's got it all. He's got anatomy. He's got book design. He's a, I mean, he's a graphic designer. He's everything in one. The colors. I mean, I, a lot of times when I look at artists, I, I sort of, in, for some reason, my mind wants to compare them with, with um, musicians. 
Mm. And for some reason, I kept I kept thinking of uh, Bowie. Oh, and, interesting. And because here's another here's another cover he did for Time War, which he redid a few That's times. Great. Those greens, Rungi, man, how you use them in like palettes you're not expecting. And then orange. <laughs> what? Well, I mean, this is kind of where the it's, Bowie thing comes in. It's that, you know, these books are 50 years old now, you know, or, you know, the, these books and these, these book covers that he was so famous for are so old now. And I'm looking at the color and the way that they're composed, but particularly, I mean, he went batshit. I mean, nobody cut, did, nobody painted with those color schemes. Until Frazetta came along and did that. And Definitely I'm, not an illustration that I saw. That and I'm aware of. No, I mean it was it was it was it just it came out of his mind and like that. It's the same way when you listen to old, to Bowie greatest hits albums. Those could be hits today. Like they don't mm -hmm. sound old. They don't sound dated. They still Bowie sound. Bowie was also a true original man. He was walking down the street in a dress when people would be knifing him in London. Right. You know. Uh, it, he didn't give a shit either. He was a true creator. So I like that analogy, actually. Well, it's just, it's like they were both from the future. Ha! <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, it's like they... Uh, I see them both from, like, the future and the past because Frazetta was really, like, like a Michelangelo, just a classic style, you know, um, that I think you could argue, yeah, he's from the past and the future because Bowie was so ahead of his time and Frank was so ahead of his time, but he was, like, bringing bringing the past back into the focus where people, I think, had kind of forgotten that a little bit. Like the triangle in, format, uh, right, Nick? Illustration. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he brought back the uh, classic triangle pyramid format, center pyramid design, uh, which was kind of lacking in all illustration, at least in uh, the Americas, until he started using it. And that's classic Renaissance, you know? So. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a bold composition to kind of break the rule of thirds and have it centered like that. But he did it so perfectly that it's it's always balanced in there. And um, if you tried to do it differently, I think it, it wouldn't work so well. So he did. And um, what you're saying about the colors is he did use such like subtle colors on his paintings. That the 60s were so neon and insane with like the illustration covers that his were more subtle and I wanted to have the NC Wyeth painting behind me because it's such a connection between the palette he used and NC Wyeth that you see it's like NC Wyeth kind of was like reborn in Frank or so even though their lives overlapped a little bit. <laughs> I definitely see that influence. And he brought the imagination that like NC Wyeth, like Andrew Wyeth is painting reality. He's a master at that. NC Wyeth is like painting like a dream. And I, I feel that same essence kind of in Frank's work. I agree, man. Uh, uh, that's the uh, the pirates are behind you, right? Yep, yep. Yeah, one of his great paintings. Yeah, uh, and I mean, look at like this and see what this is painted in 1911, but it's still <laughs> you could use it today and it would be just absolutely Holy yellow. Yeah, like, and I've seen this original in person because when I went to the Frank Rosetta Museum uh, in East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. The NC Wyeth Museum is in Chatsford, which is pretty close to there. Um, it's called the Brandywine River Museum. And it was almost like homework. Like I did the homework of seeing NC Wyeth, who's just, I think they're equal in my mind as far as the power they have on like what I think about. And then we drive a couple hours and then go to Frank's museum. And he was in his house watching baseball, I guess. But I was like, I'm I'm not gonna fucking bug him. Are you crazy? You know? Knock on the window, Nick. Hey Frank. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I would like to make it off of this property, so I'm not going to bother Frank while he's watching baseball. <laughs> <laughs> Come out and strangle, strangle you with his one working yeah. side of his body. <laughs> well, it, you could tell that Ellie was the one. She was in charge. Like, he wasn't fucking in charge. He she gave me the tour, so right? She came out. It was like a dream. I thought we were going to pull up. Since 2008, I was like 23. I was with my brother. I was with my mom. I was kind of... My brother had always had so much fine art knowledge that we were kind of teaching each other stuff at that point. And he was getting excited about seeing NC Wyeth and then Frazetta. And I thought there'd be some assistant or someone who ran the museum, even though it was attached to their house. No, she comes out of the house. She comes <laughs> over the best accent you'll ever hear. And she's like, I think she said, she's like, you look like about a fifth generation Frazetta fan. <laughs> Yep. And she's like, do you like art? And I was like, of course. She's like, are you ready to see some very fine art? And then opens up the door and yeah, gave us the tour. 
pointed out each painting, talked about how this was, she said, these gorillas were painted after Frank had, when he finally had to paint with his left hand. And he he was so happy. She says, Frank, if you just paint this and finish, like I'll cook you whatever I want, you know, and he painted it and he just slaps it down and just says, eat. That was her story. <laughs> it was the greatest. Yeah. The greatest day ever. And, um, I'll always remember it. You're like, then the assistant came and actually ran the museum and she, and uh, Ellie went back inside. Um, they let you take a picture in front of whatever one painting, you know, so I picked Dark Kingdom because I think it's it's probably my favorite one just because it's got just so much going on with just the face and the shadows and the muscles and the color. I got something special here. That's the one I'm keeping. Oh, that's cool. Awesome, man. Yeah, that one is, it was a little different. I uh, kind of wanted to leave that one a little more, a little Expressive. lighter. So it's because it's like, I'm not Frazetta. I don't know how to put the shadows in just perfectly like that to take them to full contrast and i didn't want the video to be too long so i kind of just tried to combine my style with what i thought maybe he would he would try to do if he was doing those little watercolors he did so fast and Nick, first you you blew the 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 brakes off the car doing this um oh, thanks man that was second, fun. what i like the reason i want to keep this i do like how you solve shadows and you added brown to it uh this kind of like black violet that you had going mm -hmm. uh yeah it, it's making me too messing so i'm happy to keep <laughs> this in effort um oh, my so. wife I'm wants excited. this horse and i'm sorry whoever wins this they're gonna get punched in the fucking gunt by my wife when she's <laughs> them, but i told her we got enough nick run yard and i can always hire you to do another horse the horses like kind of stole the show with that one it was way more fun to work on because i got how you got halfway through the figure and i just was just like yeah, damn, I am not Frank. And then <laughs> the horse, the point, kinda, you know. Yeah, Neither I know. of us are Frank. Yeah. I'm going to oh, be no, sitting in a butt. You know? uh, <laughs> I feel like so, it's what we have to tell ourselves every time we talk about Frazetta or try anything related to Frazetta is just have to be like, hey, it's okay. We don't have a panic attack. No we're different. Can, no one can do it like him. You know? And that's the thing is we're celebrating him and kind of cherishing the work rather than we're not trying to emulate him. We're kind of celebrating it by working with him and just kind of like a faux uh, uh, spiritual way, I'm, for lack of a better word. We, we get to be expressive while cherishing the guy and celebrating his work. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what I like about the show is we're not doing John Buscema or Frank Miller. We're doing our version on top of him while – kind of smoking his pole. And I think they would like that. They would say, hey, I want people to do their own thing because that's what they did. So it's like we let their power kind of inspire us and then, you know. Yeah, kind of ride the lightning way. for an hour or two just to have fun. Absolutely. And, and Zeta is the most powerful. <laughs> he is. Period. Yeah. <laughs> he, he basically is Conan. You know, I know Conan, people think of Schwarzenegger, who who is perfect for the movie, but... You know, that's part of, I think, what lost Frazetta the job on the thing was not selling Dino De Laurentiis' cat girl painting, and then that came back. Oh, and really? then, yeah, he actually met with Schwarzenegger, and I guess Arnold was really quiet and nice, and he was, you know, younger then. And Frank just basically said, like, you got to lose weight. you got to be more agile, like this kind of barbaric, like the paintings he had done. It wasn't and, Frank, though. That was Milius yeah. that told me. Oh, him was that Milius? Was that? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm buddies with Will Stout, who worked on the uh, movie. He did all the art. Oh, wow. Art. He was a junior art director or some crap like that on the movie that I didn't even know. Here I'm having oh, dinner with him, and he's talking about hanging with Milius and Schwarzenegger and how they used to shit on Oliver Stone. And uh, <laughs> oh, wow. it was just the wildest story. But I guess Arnold was out in the parking lot swinging the sword uh, when it was ready. And uh, Milius, and I don't know if Frazetta, Frazetta may have echoed it, but the, how, okay. uh, when uh, Stout was there, he, uh, you know, working, of course, they're all running into the parking lot to see the guy who starred in uh, Pound. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, it was really cool because Milius, you know, he's a laser knife. He pulled no punches. He's just talking about how your body's wrong for this, for that. And I guess uh, Arnold was super – Took all the critique. He's like, "What do you mean? You need a thinner arm, muscle right here." And, <laughs> and uh, he did that, and he said he came back two months later and looked exactly like Milius asked. 
Wow. He was okay. that much in control of his body and how to work out. So wow. he lost like 25 pounds. And well, he uh, actually did it then. Well, that, yeah, see, this is why it's such a legend, you know, that it's good to get yeah. the story straight from somebody who knows more than me because I just heard stuff and read things on the internet. So, you know, how that goes. But, oh, I got lucky. It was a late night uh, uh, flight cancellation and only one restaurant. So, uh, Bill Stout and I, who's in the Frazetta uh, uh, documentary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll see me as long hair. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so that's hilarious. amazing that you got to have dinner with him. He's the only comic book artist to, uh, I think, ever get uh, hired by uh, the Smithsonian to go document uh, architectural dig. Oh, you wow. know, he's had a wild life. Anyways, Frazetta. We'll do Will Stout another day. Uh, <laughs> see if I can get him on the show. But- no, well, it, it was exciting to me to find to find out that you come from artists. Oh, yeah. Oh, you thanks. Know, that's always interesting to me when 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 artists come from artists, you know, like, you know, to look at a parent's artwork and then to look at the child's artwork, like like the Ramitas, for instance. Oh, definitely. Like I loved John Ramita Sr. when I was a kid, you know, by, by the time I was a I was his his stuff was coming out as reprints when I was a teenager. You know, the Marvel Tales, they were mm-hmm. reprinting his Spider-Man run. Mm-hmm. And um, at first it, it wasn't quite at first I thought it was a little quaint. You know, compared mm-hmm. to you know Bert, Neil, you know Neil Adams and John Byrne and guys had come out since Ramita. Sure. It, it, Are we talking about senior? Yeah, senior. Yeah. Um, I, I I just I had the same thing you had that Spider Man reprint. Yeah. Blew my mind away. Marvel Tales. Loved I loved it. It. He was like crawling up a building. I remember once in one of the pages, and uh, he was like really close to the building, looking down, and it, I just that image just sticks in my head, and I don't even know what book it. Really, I couldn't find it again. But uh, his structure was amazing. Yeah, I mean, to me, basically, you know, being born in 85, like growing up, that was Spider-Man. It was his art that I saw yeah. Spider-Man. And that Absolutely. was just kind of like, oh, I, when McFarlane came along and did that really crazy stuff that's really that I love, you know, still it's so wacky. But like that was like the modern version of it that everybody thinks of. But it was really, you know, Ramita Sr. that I would see spider-man and think like oh that's what spider-man looks like and so that was just kind of for me you know even though ditko started it like that was who i would think of when you'd see it on any kind of memorabilia or shirts or lunch boxes or any of that stuff and i actually got a a marvel book that was kind of a big hardcover from you know 89 or 90 that i got a couple years later um, when i wanted to start drawing and learning anatomy it was basically all the history of Marvel comics up to like 1990. And it was in the back. It's so funny to see like the Marvel bullpen and people are inking and coloring yeah. with like coloring with actual dye and it's all in one room and everything, you know, they're doing um, color guides and stuff. And, yeah. Uh, I thought like, like that's what I want to do. And little did I know, like by the time I was old enough to do that, that would all be gone. You know? I'm sure they wanted it for the book to be like, look at this in the back. Here's how it's all done. You know? <laughs> so. Well, but Zach, I was, when you were, when you were grabbing coffee, I was talking to Nick about the fact that he comes from a family of artists and his it, dad's badass too, but you I went over there. Um, and um, and we we sort of I, I mentioned that I had met the met the Kubert brothers when they were kids. You know they were lettering heavy metal. Yeah. You know in the in the early Adam and Andy, right? Yeah, Adam and Andy Kubert. And it's it's funny to see because you can see like a little bit of their dad in them. Um, and I met Kubert as a kid. At, like, oh, cool! At, at I never movie. got to meet him. Super cool guy. Wicked. One nice. of my favorites as a kid too. He, well, he drew me a Hawkman with a ballpoint <laughs> pen. Oh my gosh, what a he's, cool dude! He's like, you want a drawing? I, and like my buddy Dave, who is a, a promotions guy for DC and super fans promotion, was the was the DC guy. So I'm like, yeah, I'll get. I'd love a sketch. I'll, I didn't even know Kubert from anything. So he drew me a <laughs> Hawkman, and I brought it home. And I said, Davey, I'm like, you want this Hawkman? I think he still got it on his wall. Oh my <laughs> gosh, it's like 30 years ago. That's amazing. <laughs> It is. Oh, uh, so, so cool. Um, but the, the funny thing about the Kubert, you know, neither of the Kubert brothers really ever were. I mean, who can really match Joe Kubert? But I feel like Ramita Jr., I feel like he matched his old man. Yeah, it's it's hard when your 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 pops has some super potent style that everybody loves, and he has, you know five different IPs that he's the iconic artist on, you know, yeah. and 
it's it's a tough shadow to live under. Nick, what was it like growing? I grew up with, you know, Commander of the Pacific Rim. Uh, you you grew up with an actual artist. What 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 is that like as far as <laughs> psychological advantages and disadvantages? Would you say? Um. Well, I mean. It's funny because my dad was also in the military, so I got a little bit of that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, he's a very calm, quiet kind of guy. So I think that I just got a different perspective, maybe like on America in a way, because I was taught to like embrace artwork. And this is something that's normal, you know, and something you could pursue. And they my parents are always smart enough to be like, look, you need to finish school and you need to uh, know that making a living as an artist is going to be really difficult. But yeah, to even encourage the idea, I really, I highly doubt that I would have done it if my parents, because my mom's a really good artist too. She doesn't, she doesn't give herself enough credit, but she really, she could draw on everything. And I think she just, she pursued graph design. So I get that aspect of dealing with clients and the, you know, illustration when I did that. And then my dad just taught art. So he knew everything there was to know about art history and, and fine art. And so, yeah, it was really just an appreciation from my parents that it's not something you could, that you're just wasting your time at, which is, I thought normal until you get to school and you realize like, Oh, that's not normal. You know, so, <laughs> you met all, assholes you know. like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was, funny. In the Frazetta documentary, you know, he mentions that his boy had talent. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and his son, his son's just like, why am I, why would I even try? He's like, my father's the greatest art, the artist alive. I mean, talk about intimidating. Oh, he's I, playing golf in the documentary, if I remember correctly, like the whole time, mm -hmm. wasn't he? Oh, if, my, if my father was selling paintings for a million dollars, I'd be playing golf too. No shit, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, just curious when that did break like the million mark for when he started selling paints. I think like when they made the documentary, it was not that like two hundred and fifty thousand isn't a shit ton of money, but um, yeah, like I, it made me curious because I think shortly after that came out, one of the Conans then broke the million mark. So yeah, it was like one 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 point one two or something like that. That Conan, That's the crazy. iconic Conan cover. Uh, which now I'm sure you can add a zero to that, probably. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Now that people understand how important he is, and it's not just a something that gets funneled into you know pop culture or something like that, because yeah, a lot of the subject matter is crazy, but uh, it's just what was in his imagination. And like you said, he would see the scenes running through his head um, in really vivid detail, and kind of just record those. So I think that nowadays people understand that he really is a fine artist the way that Michelangelo was, and he just kind of lived in the modern day. And that's how an artist would make a living in the modern day, the way that um, the fine art in the past that we call fine art now was illustration. It was all illustrated for the church. And so- Literally. Like, yeah, because that had just <laughs> all followed in that footsteps. So, mm. <laughs> you know, Caravaggio, all these people like that, that we always, not that these they're not masters, but we all had to eat, didn't we? as an artist mm -hmm. so it, there always comes a time where you got to find your threshold for where do my actual ethics lie otherwise you just kind of get sucked up and i think mm -hmm. nick you you would kind of agree to this uh maybe not my articulation but you stop being your own voice at some point you just start being mm -hmm. a dancing monkey and making people happy which personally i always felt is when an artist dies <laughs> in actual death is yeah. when they start dancing for others like I think, full time like that's their thrust exactly if you if you lose the balance because i i had it my personally I had trouble with balance so i either had to do my own thing or do illustration but i think that most people fortunately can have more of a balance but if yeah if you don't have that time for yourself to learn who you are as an artist and not just the style that you're working in to make the client happy because it's also kind of unprofessional to try to put your own style into something when you've, you know, agreed to a job in a style. Unless they ask for it. Yeah. So <laughs> you got to have that balance or you will go insane. And I think some people get a lot of satisfaction out of getting an idea from someone else. And that way they're not going crazy over trying to think of a concept or something. And then you can really just take that and, collaborate and I 
my sensitive thing was just making changes, which is so stupid. And I would always do it because it was what the job called for, but it just, it would hurt my soul. And I realized that, yeah, like, I guess I care more about the brush strokes and the composition and stuff than the story. And I thought like, all right, it's time to move on and let storytellers tell the stories instead of kind of trying to do everything. And I like the fact that people have separate strengths sometimes. So I think that stories are definitely in my mind as far as something I might want to like write someday. But as far as painting, I really enjoy comics for the strengths that those artists have and the writers. And then good fine art and good paintings or whatever you want to call it, whatever category people want to categorize it in, um, has its strength. So I think it's just it's, kind of, uh, you need a balance. I always bring up like a sports team, let's say like football. Not everybody's a quarterback, not everybody's a running back, not everybody's a lineman, but when you get them all in concert, they can mm -hmm. do anything together. It's kind of like a band of brothers. And uh, that's one thing that comic books kind of misses is that, that mm. uh, at least in my opinion. And one thing I've always admired about you, Nick, and we spoke about this before, I always still tried to, you know, you kind of probably know more than most people, my artistic thrust and desires in life. But uh, uh, one thing you always did, uh, or you did, and I uh, always admired is you just <laughs> put a fork in it and said, uh, everybody can go fuck their butt. I'm going to paint or die. <laughs> where I uh, always tried to find a way where I could, and it, it just caused just obscene amounts of stress throughout my life and career. And you were, you were there for parts of it. Uh, when you were helping me with the cape. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I always tried to make them happy while expressing myself. And mm -hmm. I think it's a losing strategy, not always, but the way I apply it, because I don't have speed. I don't have tolerance for lying and mm -hmm. things, all the things that would uh, uh, deter me or make me fail at comic books. Well, that's kind of mm -hmm. one of the things that's so crazy about Frazetta was that he was so fucking good that he could paint whatever he wanted and they would slap it on any old book. I know. That's like, what that always made me laugh. Like that's how that's how big he got. They're like just paint what you want. We'll put it on any book cuz it's going to sell a million copies. That's, that's rare rare as a unicorn, man. <laughs> that's where you're you're marketing at that point you're marketing a fine artist to people. They just don't know it. Because you're saying like you want to see his his art no matter what he paints, and he just happens to paint fantasy stuff. So they thought like, all right, that's a safe enough bet that he's not going to send us, you know, a painting of an old man in a lawn chair or something. Like, he's going <laughs> to send us Conan or someone getting murdered or someone battling or whatever. Conan you know, or a beautiful Mary. woman. Yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, yeah, right. barn in a field. <laughs> it's just. Uh... Conan. <laughs> Conan. I think it's Conan the retiree. Conan there you go. in the oh haunted God. barn. <laughs> yeah, if Robert Howard lived long enough, he would probably write stories like that, I would assume, about I'm, prom, I'm prom um, retiring too, you know. Crom. I'm going to do a little um I'm going to do a little competition here, not a competition, but I want you guys to take a look at these images I'm showing you and sure. you, have, you have I call it pick the Frazetta. Uh, it's, it's three different artists drew the same cover, drew the cover for the same novel. Oh, you wow. Have pick, you have to pick the Frazetta. It's going to be the easiest game of all time, senor. <laughs> Here's number one, the Moon Maid. <laughs> good, good effort. Uh, guy yeah. needs balance, right, Nick? Where's, I, just, where's... I think if Frank looked at that, he would say, like, it, he would not be a jerk, but he'd be like, it's nice, but, you know, uh, w like, where is he going? What's happening here? Why is, and where, you know, you need more contrast. You need more shadows and more highlights, and there's some drama in the background, you know? And this is, I don't know who painted this, but they're probably a really good artist. It's, it's confident, that, but it, you might, know, yeah. it might have been his son because it looks like a golf swing there. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is you can see the person – was either the editor, I smell editor stink on this cover. Yeah. <laughs> oh, for sure. like, uh, uh, you know those Frazetta skulls, and you know how he, he uh, paints the backgrounds almost like watercolors, right, and they just kind of fade? Do that. Yep. 
And then I smell an editor on this MF. -er. This is something I would do, or I was like, yeah, I, I need reference for that. So just take a picture of somebody like swinging a golf club here, and then <laughs> you got your reference right there. Just make sure they're ripped, you know? Yeah, but but don't, I feel like the girl's been roofied. Yeah, I feel like it's just it's two different. Relaxed. It's, it, well, <laughs> this is the thing is I would need to do this. I would need to have reference. And then you have it from different things and you want to make it look photorealistic, but you also want to make it look dynamic. And it just doesn't work because in Frazetta's mind, he just knew by that point when he was painting, he was in his 30s, then 40s, and he just understood the body. He understood light. So even though I think sometimes the faces on him can his stuff can look a little simplified or almost like a caricature, the, it's so powerful that with this I'm not sure where the light is really coming from. I mean, I guess That's what I was top left say. corner here it would make sense. Like it's not wrong. It just doesn't. Where's the blacks? <laughs> Where's yeah, the... it's very washed out, and they were probably this is after Frank's stuff started coming out. So because his argument in the documentary was that everybody's so bright and loud that if I do something more subtle with dark, more NC Wyeth colors, honestly, then it'll stand out because it's different. And then they probably thought like, well, shit, that sold a million fucking copies. So now <laughs> everybody's got to paint like that. And then all of a sudden it's only going to be different just because it's a lot better, you know? <laughs> Therefore, then the art director's like, uh, can you do this? And mm -hmm. the artist is like, I'll try. Oh, oh yeah. You want to keep your today. job. I need, yeah. woman to be, I would need the woman to be like she's on a lawn, you know, like a like she's she's tanning on a chair or something. <laughs> I'd like to see her actually yawning, really commit to the pose. <laughs> really good, <laughs> you know. Yeah, tears, she's like, yeah, you know, eyes. <laughs> we do this stupid ride every day. He's always got to spear something. Yeah, so can I? Can I just go to the store without all this drama? <laughs> 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 Just going to the, the supermarket or 7-Eleven. All I wanted was a big gulp. <laughs> <laughs> Got to ride my asshole centaur that's practicing his golf swing the whole way. Oh, for sure. All right. <laughs> now, now I'm going to give you the second one. Now let me know if this is Frazetta or not Frazetta. Sure. Same title. <laughs> <laughs> mm. um, that one, I don't know. This, If it is, it's extremely early. Frazetta. <laughs> That's but I don't think Zeta. it is. You know, um, this was for Zeta at age three. Yeah. I Look at sure. the uh, torso so. of the woman, Nick. Yeah. And then how the right arm overlaps itself for no reason, like she's missing the bottom half of her arm. I'm sure for even suggesting that it could be his, his ghost will find a way to slap me. You know? yeah. uh, <laughs> he's gonna, the Bronx boy is going to come out. And he's going <laughs> to possess this little fellow team. here and attack me. <laughs> Wouldn't yeah, that be great? A ghost with a Bronx accent? Would that be the most annoying yeah. ghost of all time? Yeah. The Brooklyn ghost. <laughs> hey, boo! You scared? Yeah. <laughs> boo! And this one, the centaur looks nervous in this one. He does. He looks kind of like a, uh, like an, I don't know, a troll or an elf or something. <laughs> He's a little uncertain. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I actually feel bad because he or she was born without a neck. Yes. Um, probably yeah. a really good wrestler. Then can't yeah. choke, can't no. choke the centaur out. No. Nope. So biological the art, advantage. Like, the artist who painted this is still alive and just listening. He's, He's crying, crying right now. <laughs> he, I'm sure he cried when he saw Frazetta's version too. Oh, I'm sure. Well. He, he probably he <laughs> probably trashed his studio. Yeah, he probably quit. He's probably a, a banker now. Hey, you need a home mortgage? I used to paint. Mm -hmm. He probably has a bunch of copies of that book and he keeps them under his desk. Let's just check well, out the cover. I mean, imagine being Ron Lim and somebody calling you up and saying, hey, Perez got sick. We need somebody to finish the Infinity Gauntlet. <laughs> it's like, you want me yeah, to? Yeah, you're like, well, it stops then. It's over. <laughs> no Infinity here. I mean, I don't, I don't know how you win. <laughs> yeah, the Infinity, there's no Infinity. It's not. Yeah. It's a finite. Yeah. And the end of Infinity is now. Hey, Ron. <laughs> How you doing? Ron's like, yep. Yeah, send me the script. I'm in. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's amazing, like, uh, walking in another person's shoes. Obviously, I did that for Hellboy. I had to match Corbin and Mignola, and that was intimidating as all fuck. Uh, but I learned a lot, and it kind of led to wanting to do this. Um, there's something beautiful that happens when you're kind of working with another artist, even non-verbally. 
at least with me, I'm learning, I'm inspiring. Uh, it makes me have a greater uh, appreciation almost. Not that I couldn't love certain artists anymore, but there's just something, there's an intimacy, you, you know, when you do that. Uh, that I really like. I don't, did you feel that at all, Nick, when you were painting it? I know you talked about intimidation, but, and of course I'm intimidated even right now as we speak. <laughs> maybe, maybe as uh, he'll take those ghost, uh, the, the fence pickets that he did for the, the, the portrait and beat me over the head with them. There you go. Uh, yeah, yeah, ripped off more, the fence. There we go. I, I'd like to think, I'd like to think that he was, a, he's a gentle ghost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. He would just take your he would take your brush and just like break it. And you'd be like, why does this keep happening? Did you uh no, I'm how, just messing other I'm just than the intimidation, <laughs> uh other than the intimidation, Nick, uh how does it make you feel? Because you're a true fine artist. I'm still somewhere in between like the asshole that I am. Uh you know oh, where no, I mean before yeah, before I get into it, man, do not sell yourself short. It's a it's a your knowledge of storytelling and anatomy is ridiculous. So I uh, talk about intimidation. I could put that on uh, towards you as well, you know. But yeah, <laughs> no, I just I just felt inspired. And yeah, there were little moments. I think the horse kind of went better than I thought it would. I thought that would be the part that was really difficult, as if I understand horse anatomy. Of course I don't, you know, but there's just looked at a few different like pictures you know um fun reference for this one typing in nude on horses you're like oh boy here we go <laughs> <laughs> i just typed in nude horse it got really good <laughs> yeah you're gonna start getting some weird facebook ads popping up oh for sure <laughs> looking oh. for a nude horse <laughs> speaking, exactly. of, speaking of horses and, and nudes uh this is going to be cover number three for zeta or not for zeta Oh wow! Oh, see, oh, there we go. Well, there's, that's there's stupid strange. proof right there, sir. Yeah. <laughs> you can just oh, you can always cover. tell by the counterposing of the uh, torso versus the butt, the 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 hip cage, even on it like the centaur. Look at that arc, you and, know. And even the, the centaur can't even see her butt, but is still reacting to it. Yeah, look at his eyes. Yep. <laughs> there. Yeah, and look how it's funny because. It's it's moving away from the viewer, and yet it's still more engaging than the other covers, just because of the composition. That kind of S curve. If you go from the word "made" and go through the moon down through all the way to the front of the horse's hooves, it's that perfect composition. The spear kind of follows through, and it just guides your eye. And nobody even knows that. They just know that. Wow, that one looks like it's moving. And you can see the movement, the way it, it links up with the wind, and everything makes sense. And it's just, he doesn't overdo it. Look at the cape, look at everything where he could look have put a lot more wrinkles. Look how the stops the motion, like though. Mm. Look, at, that's something I stole from Frazetta, is uh, uh, counterposing inanimate objects in your, so he creates that X, which kind of stops your eye for a moment, mm. and it leads you right back into it. So now I'm looking at the legs, and then the girl's leg, and you go back up her, and it creates this nice kind of trapezoidal pyramid format that my eye just keeps going back and back and back and back to. Exactly. Uh, that's one of the things I never really hear about uh, for Zeta, and it might just because I don't listen to anything, but uh, uh, his, his ability to compose, there's simple triangle compositions often, but they engage you forever, which that's the rarity. It's, it's poster art that doesn't get bored. Boring, I mean. Uh, I just don't get tired of looking at it. I can look at a horse butt muscle for an hour. It's bizarre. <laughs> and I'm only partially in the horse butts. So, yeah. I mean, it's a, a big thing for me. That it's I'm a big compliment against. coming from you, yeah. Like you don't I know. All People know I'm not really into horse butts. I try to be yeah, nice. But, uh, reading, like, horse butt monthly or whatever the magazines you get. In the quarterly, quarterly sir. <laughs> who, who's anti-horse butt? I mean, nobody's totally against it, you know? People might pretend. They could pretend, but they're all liars. <laughs> yeah, they're all liars. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's interesting. Did you feel any... You know, I, I don't mean to keep harping on this, but I, I no. kind of feel electricity when I uh, ink on some of these artists. And for Zeta, of course, though, I'm way more nervous than, say, uh, like a Mike Zeck drawing. Not that I, I don't absolutely love Mike Zeck art, but it doesn't make me nervous. When mm -hmm. I'm inking this guy's work, my hand is uh, literally is resisting wanting to touch the page. 
you know? Oh yeah, I, I felt the same way. And yeah, as intimidating as it was, I was definitely excited and inspired. And it's like getting to step into their shoes in a way because the form that he puts down is so perfect that you can kind of take it in several different ways, as long as the lighting is kept somewhat correct. And it's almost just like a, having the teacher's guide or something. It's amazing. And um, yeah, I felt so excited. And for a couple of moments, yeah, when it's before I screw up something that I love while it's working, you get to feel pretend like you're Frank for a minute. Just be like, wow, I wonder, I wonder if this is how he would approach it. And then I say, well, of course not, you know, because I look back <laughs> at his watercolors and they're so finely done. That not only is it a different approach, but he's putting down a really, really incredibly light wash first. And I can just see it just by looking at those. And then he's reinforcing the line work. And there's really not a lot of gradation in a lot of the watercolors until you see he'll put in one last wash, I feel like. And it's just a perfect, it's perfectly smooth. So I don't know if he was building it up with tiny little brush strokes, really tiny. So you can see some of those almost like cross hatching in some of his watercolors. And then other ones that are my favorite. Um, are done clearly with putting down a bigger wash and stuff. So yeah, it's it was really fun to just wonder how in the hell he would have approached it. And, you know, watching me paint it again and looking at some of the shadows and things I put in, I wonder if I would have tried it differently based on his thing. But um, that's, once I was halfway in it, I kind of just had to continue and- um, Commit? Yeah. So it's like when I'm watching you ink this here, and it's so interesting how you get those big areas of shadow worked in like that and then start working in the detail. And it's just, it has to be completely different um, from watercolor because you really need that structure and foundation. And then you kind of all of a sudden, when you put more detail into it, the, the forms become more subtle. And then, and I know that just from looking at your comic work, um, but I'm really curious, yeah, how you finish off something that Frank drew just with the, the subtle pencil shading and things that he put in there. I don't know if you're working on top of an ink drawing he did or if that was one of it his pencil drawings. Is and it? I do okay. that. I couldn't find a good pencil that I could get done in a reasonable amount of time. You know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. a lot of his pencils are set up for watercolor or mm -hmm. uh, it, oil, whatever. And I would need a little bit of practice. To I mean, I'd probably need about a good 10, do this about 10 times for me to be able to ink his actual pencils. So mm -hmm. I figured true. that his inks are so expressive. And then two, the contrast can be seen on the, uh, I learned that from, I forgot which episode we did. Uh, uh, maybe it was the Zek or something. You can see the pencils now, the blue line on film is what I'm trying to say. Um, uh, okay. So it's kind of a, uh, and that's a little bit of a cop out. <laughs> um, yeah. Somebody asked me, Hey, aren't those inks already? Yes but I'm inking them as myself. I'm just using them as tight pencils uh, for contrast on camera. So people can actually see what I'm inking. And then two, uh, I can get it done in a reasonable amount of time because this show moves and every, anybody who knows me, uh, 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 speed and Zach or unless there's a word lack thereof involved in the sentence, aren't found very <laughs> often. <laughs> Uh, and, it's great uh, how it how the ink really does look like pencil here because it's so much lighter in the value that um yeah it just allows you to kind of do your own thing on top of it um, yeah and i have a more definitive rhythm i have more uh uh his brain juice leaking onto the page as opposed to just a quick sketch you know what i'm saying so mm -hmm. there's certain artists i it, it, i mean you could give me a mike mignola pencil and i can make it look pretty goddamn close to mike mignola to the mm -hmm. point where Mike would forget if he drew it or me. Uh, like <laughs> if I did an old drawing of his. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I have trouble even part of my career was just getting rid of old Mignola influences uh, because I was getting hired only because of that. Um, uh, but that being, that being said, uh, you got to be really careful in comics. Otherwise, you get typecast and you're just the uh, doofy neighbor in a sitcom, you know. <laughs> that's your career now. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so it's mostly just speed and contrast. And two, I know his thoughts a little bit better. So if you see me inking an artist from inks, it's either we couldn't find good pencils or, uh, it's in a, a combination of intimidation and needed speed. So 
but in doing so, I, I, like I said, to, I feel like I'm, I know more of what their thought process is, if that makes sense. So totally. silver lining. And along the lines of speed, you know, that's one of the other things about Frank that was so legendary. <laughs> he was blasting out those paintings overnight. Yeah, like a day, day and a half with a hairdryer. <laughs> oh, I know. And to think about that, just think about the time it takes if you have six hours and all that detail. Like that's, you're down to the seconds of things just having to be right the first time. Because even if you make a mistake, you know, with oil paint, then you have to build it back up. You have to build those highlights back in and everything. And if it's done in six hours, that means it's done all a prima, which is like <laughs> when it's all wet. Like there's no drying of layers and coming back. I don't understand later. how he does that with oils, man. To keep it so clean. It was just, he was so sure of it and he would just do it fat over lean, which means that you put really thin wash down first, kind of the way I, I've heard that he would take burnt sienna or burnt umber and kind of just start making these kind of squiggly shapes. And you'd have a, maybe a sketch or two of just the kind of feeling, um, and then, yeah, that's really, you want to, with oil paint, you want to have thin first because it dries so slowly that if you have thick paint and then thin paint over that, it will crack and all this stuff. So to be able to do a masterpiece like that in six hours, he obviously knows all of that instinctually. And um, like Bashki says in the, in the documentary, he's just like, yeah, I mean, overnight's impressive. He's like, but craziness and fear, that can make people do stuff overnight. He's like, doesn't mean it would be, wouldn't be as impressive if he spent a week on it. But the fact that he could get it to that level in five or six hours, yeah, that everything has to be perfect. Like it's like Mozart would just write down music finished in his, from his mind onto the page without making corrections or anything. And when I, like when you watch Amadeus, it made me think of Frank Frazetta because yeah. People just couldn't believe it. They wouldn't believe it. And then they'd come watch him do it. And like he says, they go away shaking their heads. Like, there it is. You know, so. They're both they're both savants. Mm -hmm. That is for certain. And there's Definitely. only there's only so many in a given period of time that uh, you're while you're on earth that you're gonna find actual genius, seminal pr prodigal talent. Not only prodigal talent, prodigal talent that was utilized to its maximum it, mm -hmm. you know because that's rare too nick when you see these super super talented people they they tend to not want to grow and i'm sure you've seen that before too though you're a super talented person you're one of the only oh, true man. fine artists that i know that have an inherent obscene ability and then amplified on that talent so compared oh, to man. where like when we met you know and you're mm -hmm. a doe like did and helping me on whatever book um, mm -hmm. just watching you gain that confidence and then become your own and then make the bravest decision of any pro artist I'm personally connected to. Uh, it was really neat watching it. Now watching you flourish um, is really interesting and is because you're a grinder uh, from what I can tell you just worked and worked and worked and worked and thought and worked and thought and worked and thought uh, and you got to where you're at now and, I, I think your trajectory, I don't know. You may get some uh, Instagram followers off of this. I'll see if some of my fans will uh, follow you, Nick. <laughs> so you can get a couple. But uh, oh, man. It's you're, you're really here. coming into your own, Nick. And I know you don't like uh, getting uh, in on air uh, cock strokings, but uh, I got to give you, I got to hug your nuts for a minute. I'll you're take one them of the most anywhere. Impressive. I can get them off air, on air, anything. Any yeah, just <laughs> get touching. Um, <laughs> but no, I dude, it means to tell you was, that. Oh, go, go, go. Yeah. I mean, watching being around you and just watching what it took to actually do something for real at a really high level. Of course it scares the shit out of me, but then you either quit or you don't. So that's the, for me, yeah, I don't understand not getting better. I think there's certain habits I'll always have that I'll never be able to break that I don't, I don't have to even think about them, drawing habits and, and things like that, the way I see light that I try to kind of get away from. But it was really seeing your work ethic that made me think that, yeah, I, it not only told me, like, I need to either work at that level to stay in comics or put that energy somewhere else. So, yeah, I remember 
not even really understanding line weight and why. I remember you asking me, like, why is this line here? And I was just like, I have no idea, you know? <laughs> like, it just <laughs> felt like it should go there. And, and then you said, like, well, let's, you know, make sure you think about that. Every single line has to mean something. And don't just put in random hatching if it's not going to build up to a value or, or show the light and, and things like that. I mean, that's universal. It doesn't matter whether you're drawing or painting or working on the computer or anything. Just understanding that and just thinking about what you're doing because a lot of the times I just was not doing that and then I wondered like why can't I remember how that arm works or that way because I'm not thinking about it I would just be translating the reference and so it made me think about stuff and then inevitably like I overthink shit then I start thinking about my <laughs> life and then I start being like hey maybe I'm lying to myself trying to say I'm a comic book artist when they're actual comic book artists doing that you know it's like saying like I'm going to be like, if you're out of shape, you know, like I'm going to get into shape and be like, hey, whoa, I don't want to get like too ripped, you know? And it's like, <laughs> cross I don't that get too bridge when you get there. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that's a problem you want to have. Trust me, you know? And yeah. So I you just can decide like, that when you look like Arnold. Exactly. <laughs> <You can> just... <laughs> well, we, um, should, we should talk about that story again because I had misheard that he actually, Frank actually sat down with Arnold, you know? So I love how the tale just gets longer and weirder, like the more. It's out he of may have and everything, you know. It it gets to the point where it's like, oh yeah, they arm wrestled, and Frank beat Arnold, and then yeah. Arnold cried, and then said, you know, something <laughs> like that. Or, I didn't know that like Arnold actually took the advice. I mean, that's such a compliment to him, you know. That yeah, I know that's he was why talking where about, greatness comes from. Know your deficits oh, yeah. and find out who. If someone's willing to help you get rid of that deficit, listen mm -hmm. to them. Yeah, it doesn't mean you have to do exactly what they say, but they're trying to impart knowledge to you that you can. It was like, uh, our, well, first I want to circle back. Nick, you, mm -hmm. the funny thing is you inspired me back, uh, which oh, was man. funny because I watched your bravery of just quitting and moving to L.A. And, you know, I watched you live lean, uh, even in, obviously, even in here in Colorado. And, mm -hmm. uh, hell, I think I only gave you your only home-cooked meals half the time. Um, I was so poor. It was insane. So, yeah, <laughs> the Moana? <laughs> where oh we had God. to like fist yeah. fight like uh, crackheads to get into your apartment? Um, <laughs> it's not far from the truth. But that, uh, that apartment, they literally started remodeling and just didn't tell the residents. Yeah, like, like there'd be walls a in your camera underneath my apartment going at like 7 a.m. And I kind of wandered down there, like rubbing my eyes, like, what's going on? <laughs> They're like, we're working, bro. Like, get out of here. You can't be in here. It's a jackhammer. I'm like, this is my apartment. What are you, you know? And then eventually there's just a notice on the door. Like, you have 16 days of AK. Like, we got rich people moving in here. So, wow. Oh, <laughs> yeah. the Moana. A, yeah, I know. It was funny. It's a good But those are the things that make you hard. Yeah, it's a good Nick, you, 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 you lived lean and you succeeded. So, when you're not quite as lean, if you still have that juice, you, you still got that juice, man. You're, you're not resting. And uh, oh, that's the amazing thing because it, it's really – you're one of the only humans on earth I've ever seen go, well, I don't like this even though I got a career in it. I'm going to go be a fine artist. And as we all know, it's really easy to become a fine artist, you know. <laughs> and uh, It's still a struggle. And, yeah, sorry to keep cut you off again. Hopefully it okay. doesn't need too much editing for me jumping into things and being so rude here. <laughs> Please be rude, sir. But no, uh, I wanted to get into. So I just wanted to tell you that it, it's, inspiration works both ways. Even though at one point in time I was uh, way ahead of you in in several areas of art generation and blah blah blah. It it's it was fun to watch you take what little knowledge I could impart to you. Uh, most you get got you lifting weights and stuff, but uh, uh, taking care of your body, but mm -hmm. which is part of it. Um, despite what uh, the the herd of comic book artists you've seen uh, look like, it, it's an extremely important part of art generation is being healthy enough to continue it and uh, uh, or do it for long periods of time. I, I regardless, I'm just saying I personally don't feel like I did a lot for you, but uh, I'm honored I helped you even a little. But I wanted to let you know you've you've returned the favor because watching you succeed fearlessly was one of the things when I felt I had to quit this, this industry uh, because it was making me mentally unhealthy. Uh, it, it, it's 
the thing that kind of it's one of the factors I'd say that kind of just said fuck it. You know, that Nick can do it out in a place that's really difficult to live. <laughs> you know, um, so it uh, an inspiration works both ways. So now I do my own book and make everybody very unhappy. That's you, Nick. <laughs> They can all blame me, right? Yeah. Though I did just take a commercial job, I got to tell uh, JC about. Oh, is that uh, the Hasbro thing? Yeah. Cool. So uh, uh, I need money. My wife uh, had to shut down the hospital and go back home for a bit. So uh, you're going to see Zach dancing like a hooker monkey for the uh, <laughs> next month. <laughs> Hey man, you gotta, got you gotta do what you gotta little, do. So. My hooker monkey hat and outfit. <laughs> JC's playing an organ grinder in the back, do, 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 and I'm out there just shucking and jiving. Um, <laughs> hey, you yeah, like it's, TMNT? It's, <laughs> it's funny, Zach, that you talk about like inspiring both ways because yeah, it really was bouncing back and forth. I thought like, well, Jesus, like he can do this, you know. And it was even though you were still working in comics, I already saw kind of the uh, independent. I don't want to say streak, but like I saw the independent energy in you versus other comic book artists because I felt like, oh, he actually thinks about shit and gives us a damn about things and um, thinks about everything, every aspect of the drawing and every little panel and not just that I want to draw Batman and stay drawing that. And that's awesome. Batman's amazing, you know, or Superman or Spider Man or anything. Um, but you, it just struck me as somebody who actually thought about every single thing you were doing. So I kind of yeah, just took that and really started to think of like, what, what do you want from life? What do I want to be? And what are the strengths? And it was really more of like letting you go and continue to do that because it just gets farther and farther, farther. Cause I'm, I will never, I will never ever catch you as far as like, just, I think your knowledge of just something dynamic, how to, how to put motion and power and feeling into something and, I try to take it a different way, like with portraits and kind of put that same power into like a face or something with a very light kind of abstract way. But yeah, it's funny how artists, we think about each other more than we might realize. Um, or even like to admit, <laughs> you know, we have a mm -hmm. good, we have a good, healthy relationship. I think it's easier for me to say it, you know, sure. yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of artists that inspired me. You wouldn't hear a peep out of me. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it was really interesting uh, watching you go from, hey, I think this is my dream and this is how life works to, I don't want to fucking do this. I can do this over here. Instead, I see yeah, somebody else doing it, so I'm going to do it. You and know? it's like you don't, yeah, you don't think about, and it's a good thing because it was so scary and just bad and, and terrible at first that you don't think about like, oh, I, oh no, like did they also go through this? You just think like, no, they're doing it. And it's a good well, thing because it's like motivation of like, if they could do it, I could do it. If you knew the struggles that every artist was thinking about every day, I think I would just run the other way. I'm, like, well, I can't. <laughs> I'm going to end up in an man. institution or something, you know, trying to get help from a therapist and <laughs> yeah, not become a paralegal you know, or yeah, something, you know, I, I have done that. I'm not, you know, ashamed to admit, definitely seen therapists just because I think it's a normal thing for people to do when you have a problem, you know, but I don't want it to be caused by the art. I would like the art to be something that helps <laughs> with that, you know, so when it has Mitigated. to become your job, it's very hard. Because art expression should be about getting what's inside of you out for other people to digest mm -hmm. uh, and understand for whatever motivation, uh, mm -hmm. which all the countless motivations of illustration. Um, but it, some people... I don't know. They embrace it in a way that uh, others don't like Frank. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't generate. I mean, I can feel his pain having to get something done in a day. You worked in comics. I fuck. I drew Nightwing an entire issue in 18 days. You know, uh, I'm not happy doing that, but we've all had to do it. And I think by doing it, it kind of, if you can kind of qualify and parse that feeling and emotion down all the truth is in there and i think comic books can reveal it because it's easily out of all the things i've done it's still the hardest fucking thing ever remotely attempted uh and not just the drawing it's the endurance man I, you were there nick it just 
It yeah. takes years off your life. I, I know it took years off of my life to draw things like aliens or something like that, the cape. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I'm going to take years off my life, like a pro fighter, I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to first make my skill set uh, yeah, imitable and whatever that is, whatever level I can draw it. I'm not Frank uh, Frazetta. But within the means, know what you're capable of, and then you just push yourself just a hint past it. And, Nick, I think this is something you got good at doing, too. You, you, you lose the fear. You learn how to – you try something, and it's going to make your decision-making process better for you as an artist and what you want, whether it is just drawing Batman uh, like a dumbass for your whole career uh, or I, – I shouldn't say dumbass. It's, it's their – prerogative um you know not everybody has to be as is uh stupid as me uh in their career you can find your happiness anywhere but at that last part where you say you have to find your happiness somewhere because a lot of people are not even trying to find ah and i think the struggles where you find that man oh i hate Mm -hmm. this i hate this this makes me happy can i do x how do Mm -hmm. i do x it makes you become a far better, more dynamic person when you pursue what you love rather than do what's expected. Absolutely. And if you, I think if people are looking for more of an outlet or balance, if they are just kind of overwhelmed by things, even if you think, oh, I have zero time in the deadlines, it's like make an hour or something to just work on something you like because it's going to, your blood pressure will go down. I swear, you know, even if it's difficult because it's and something you grow maybe, more, right yeah that's like where the growth comes from when you go back to working on the thing you hate you'll think like hey this is okay because now i know who i am you know whereas like you're just going at it before thinking like who am i as an artist <laughs> and i'm just kind of got really i think i'm good at kind of this style but then you always have the person you're emulating you'll never be better you might get as good as them but they're inventing that and you're just kind of just you're, kind of looking at it yeah, yeah, like you can't. It's <laughs> Willem de Kooning's like an incredibly abstract artist, so it's funny to bring him into a Frazetta discussion. But he basically said, because people said, "Oh, everyone's copying your style now," and he said, "I don't care because you can't copy the bad ones. Like you can't, you can't copy the foundation when you're building that up. You can only look at the ones that are in the gallery, the ones that worked, and you can see like try to break those down. But you don't see the attempts. You don't see all the things that didn't work because they're really building it up from scratch, from nowhere. And I think that um, that's a really important thing is to try to find your happiness. And then by doing that, you'll not only hopefully feel a little more free, but you'll also be able to kind of find your voice and build something up from its foundation. And other people will be emulating it. And, I agree a hundred percent with what you're saying. And uh I think it's it, it's important too. How you articulated it was excellent too, Nick. Yeah. Oh, thanks, man. We all start emulating somebody. It's how you learn, and you want to mm-hmm. emulate a lot of different people, so you start learning. Mm-hmm. But what a lot of, especially when you're young, what you don't realize that, that artist you see, it's 100 percent that person's journey, how they mm-hmm. became that artist and their ability. You're not mm-hmm. emulating their journey. You can't because it's there's so many an infinite amount of complicated variables that made that person and what they do. You can learn about it, but you you can't go on the journey with them. So you can't do what they do. You just, no matter how hard you try. I mean, uh, yeah, that should be, that should maybe be a quote from this podcast is you can't emulate someone's journey. You can emulate everything else. Um, Yes. But the art comes from the journey, the voice, shall we say, you are what you've done. And, and, Mm -hmm. and, (laughs) Your art is literally the language of what's inside of the artist, whatever Mm -hmm. moniker you want to say, your soul, your whatever uh, uh, is inside of you, comes out in a language that you invent by living and experiencing Mm -hmm. things and having goals and stuff. So if you're all you're trying to do is copy uh, uh, Picasso, uh, uh, you know, with eyeballs on the same side of the face or I'm going to have my own blue period. You're missing the point. Picasso mm-hmm. had to do those because his body and brain and it forced them to, uh, mm-hmm. you know, for the most part where I think that's a missing element, at least in illustration. There was, <laughs> inter- was an interview with John Byrne years ago. And he said, you know, there's a guy out there named um, Dale Cohn 
And <laughs> he does a better John Byrne than I do now. <laughs> and there's a guy named Emin, Stuart Eminen, and he's doing a better Adam Hughes than Adam Hughes. <laughs> and there's, um, you know, there was a, there was a lot, he went down a long list of guys who were, you know, had been sort of replaced <laughs> by, uh, it was uh, Arthur Adams. They had, he said, Scott Campbell's doing a better Arthur Adams than Arthur Adams right now. <laughs> you shut your mouth. Um, but yeah. uh, you shut your dirty mouth. But uh, uh, to your point, um, you, even those guys, uh, Arthur Adams, yeah, he was a bit of a golden clone at first, just like I was a Mignola clone at first. It's why I got hired. And two, when you take like uh, Terry Dodson and Adam Hughes. Yeah. Um, so uh, Dodson's far enough now. He has kind of his own thing, but he was just straight up uh, chewing on Adam Hughes's nuts uh, for a long time. Uh, and I'm not making a value call, just. Is well, what I mean, it is. If you but, look at if you look at early Adam Hughes work, it's clearly he's trying to be Steve Rude, and then there Steve you Rude go. <laughs> yeah, um, but the difference is Adam Hughes became Adam Hughes. Terry Dotson filled a void, and mm -hmm. this is was my point: is people wanted more Adam Hughes art. People mm -hmm. wanted more uh, uh, Arthur Adams art. Um, mm -hmm. I guess if your name is Arthur, people want fucking more of it. But. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, my point being is lots of times these guys and, and girls, but it's comics. So it's probably, it's mostly a stupid guys club, but uh, some people, when they fill that void, they start getting, they, they're getting all that energy from the famous artist because people want Arthur Adams comics. Mm -hmm. So if you can draw close enough to them, you sate that kind of uh, uh, itch that people are just so desiring. Um mm -hmm. But I think it's kind of like uh, starting a drug habit. It's hard to quit. And you just kind of keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. And I don't think you ever really find a voice. Some escape that because, mm -hmm. well, we all, all the successful ones escape that. To JC's point, Adam Hugh or whoever uh, was talking, the uh, uh, Steve Rude clone, mm -hmm. you know, or a little Dave Stevens, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I don't I know. Think that artists, I, I think artists get so... It's like if you can draw like someone that everybody loves, so you can essentially make them feel that magic again. So they want you to be the person who brings the magic. So I think they start realizing that like, oh, I'm just the person who brings magic from that other person. It's like if some girl calls you and says like, hey, what are you up to? And you're like, hey, I don't know. What are you doing? They're like, I'm looking for your friend's number. I'm like, all right, well, <laughs> let me get it for you. And she's like, wow, you're the best at getting my friend's number for me. And you're like, that's me. You know, I can find it real fast. So like you get famous at like being the person who has that number. And then you probably realize like, well, I would like to be the one that people actually desire as far as my art. And sometimes it's just too hard to give up all the work you've done. I remember when I was trying to be a Drew Struzan clone, and like I met Drew and I finally realized that, oh yeah, like no one's going to be him because he's the, he's the one who kind of perfected, he didn't invent the movie poster, but kind of perfected it in the style he used. Um, Within our lifetime, most certainly. Yeah. And he was such a sweet, humble guy. I mean, I thought I would go to his house for a few minutes and just be like, hi, Mr. Struzan, like, can you sign this? You know, he was very Did nice. Are you waking just... up cooking him breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It went so well. <laughs> <laughs> Best <Right>. date ever. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just kind of interesting where people get caught in that trap. They're afraid to leave it. The sanctity. They got a house. They got, they're paying their bills. They go to a con. People are smoking their poles. It's hard. It's mm -hmm. hard to let go of that. And, uh, so I'm not hating on people like Terry Dotson or something like that to each their own. Um, and the guy has plenty of drafting ability. That goes without saying. Um, mm -hmm. But I'll never respect him artistically like I do Arthur Adams. Because in my mind, he's not – he's still a Led Zeppelin cover band. He can play the shit out of the guitar and sound like Jimmy Page, but it's still not Led Zeppelin. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and it's like, and it I'm sorry, a, Terry. This is just on it. If you hear this, I'm not trying to shit on you. It's just uh, an Terry example. Dotson is a legend. Like he, no. he's a legend. I know what you mean, though, because it's like it's it takes such an incredible amount of talent and skill to even be able to emulate people like that. 
that it's such a compliment that yeah, it's easy to get to get lost in that, like you're saying, and to just stay in that because you're being complimented all the time because you're doing that other style and you do it really well. And you think like, Jesus, why doesn't somebody else step up and try to take my title? And you realize like, oh, they can't because I really am, this is kind of one of the best at this thing, but you do just like you see, you get trapped in that. So it's a, it's not an insult to them as a person, but you're saying like, yeah, you want somebody who made their own path. You kind of look, I think everybody. And that's looks my personal that. feel. There's, I got friends that just draw Batman for 20 years and they're perfectly happy. And I can't judge that. I can't, I've never found the happiness they have. So I should just shut the fuck up. But, uh, uh, that being said, artist, I see them more again as craftsmen at like, like super smart, super talented craftsmen, which again is nothing wrong, but that'd be the word I used, not mm-hmm. artist. You have artistic ability, but you're not being an artist. You know, I don't know. I'm not trying to, I'm worried I'm creating drama, but uh, I, I'm just trying to illustrate a point here that, you know, I don't know what I was like. You're saying it was love towards the human. We're just critiquing art. You know what I mean? Like, it's, there you unless, go. unless we know the person and we know they're shitty, like we're not, it has nothing to do with them. It's just we're talking about the artwork. There's a, there's a guy who used to work with Neil Adams at Continuity named Gr- Tom Grindberg. The, yeah. Um, this guy? Well, I don't really, hmm. Anyways, now he does Frazetta. Oh, wow. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. He draws the Tarzan strip, and, oh. um, and does, <laughs> he does. Look a at that color. slip brush he's trying, Nick. Look at that. Yeah, I mean, like, look, this is that one especially. That's beautiful work, but it's like you just see, you're like, wow, look at that Frank drawing. You're like, oh wait, so that's. Oh, I don't it know. looks like a Frank sketch. It's still a little stiff, um, yeah. but it's starting to get towards Frank. Is how I describe this guy's yeah. stuff. And I, I just think like, what life is that like to just always wonder like, how would they do it? How would they do it? It's kind of like. I don't know, having training wheels or something. Like eventually you just want to like in Forrest Gump when he's running and all the braces are falling off his legs. Like that's when you finally <laughs> get your voice as an artist. You're like, get this shit off of me. You know what I mean? So And I, I do Batman in just a short five years, Jenny. Well it was like <laughs> um it was like watching um Sinkevich, you know. I mean he was I remember picking up like a black and white, you know, independent his maybe his first comic ever when I was a kid. And um I was like, my God, I said, this guy is, does Neil Adams better than Neil Adams. <laughs> I mean, this, this guy's crazy. And then, you know, 10 years later, he was doing Electra, Electra Assassin. And, um, you know, I think, you know, which I think didn't just change comics, but actually even changed the film industry. I mean, like <laughs> the approach that he used to that, you know, that the randomness, I think it changed MTV. I changed. I think it changed cinematography. I think it changed all kinds of stuff. But he started out. All of his fundamentals came right out of Continuity Comics, you know, and Neil Adams. Yeah, uh, Frank Miller was a Kniff guy, you know, and things like that. You know, using those hard blacks. And again, we all have a starting point, right? It's That's, it's, it's at, at some point. Can you make it your own journey? You know? Yeah, it's so interesting to hear that about Bill Sienkiewicz because I love his art so much, and I had no idea <laughs> where he where he learned. Um, but yeah, that, it usually is trying to step in for someone else, and then you realize like, oh, in order to do that, I have to get these fundamentals down. You know, and then if you can do that, it's so cool because it's such a different style. You know, Sienkiewicz has his style is so unique and so powerful, and just. He's certainly always, a fine, he's a fine artist working in comics and like look when to say fine art it's so it sounds like such an insult to comic book artists nothing in the damn world is more difficult than drawing a comic book yeah. <laughs> you know? so those people Thanks who are like, saying, oh, man, you just you just draw comics like they can go to hell because it's so hard it's the hardest thing on the earth you know what I mean so I think that. Sinkevich just stands out as someone who you could take his work and just frame it and put it in a gallery right along anybody, you know, in any gallery, and it would be fine. And that's kind of what I was saying. He is like a he's like a gallery artist within comics who can tell a story in that style and not have it seem ridiculous or it's it's all cohesive. And that's what I love about seeing his stuff. It really and does he, completely inspire me too, the way he uses lines and, and washes and things. Well, he he also falls into that that category of guys who can do whatever. Like when you watch the Frazetta documentary, Frazetta can pick up clay and be a master sculptor. 
He can pick up a pencil and be and draw, do a master a master drawing. Mm -hmm. He can pick up a paintbrush and be the best, you know, watercolor artist. He can pick up, you know, oil paints and change the world. You know, you know, Neil Adams. I love Neil Adams. He's one of my favorite comic artists. You know, beautiful to look at and great with a pen or with a or with a brush, but he can't really paint. Mm -hmm. You know, when he starts to paint, it starts to look weird. Um, it's a yeah, and that's a really good point. Is it's hard to take something from start to finish completely. Like my weakness at this point is building things, starting them. I have I do really good observation, but as far as imagining things and building them up, that's kind of the sketchy area. But then a lot of people, like you're saying, the finishing is what they have trouble with. The surfaces and the light, and that's all painting. It's kind of like that fin finishing that off. So. To see Frank do it all, yeah, it's so frustrating, you know, because it's just like he just had that inside of him. And I think, you know, to give a little bit of human qualities back to Frank, like you see the early stuff and you do see how he really did learn, you know, and it's, it's how Foster lookalikes at first, then building his own. Anatomy. Like everybody yeah. <laughs> who wasn't a Hal Foster lookalike. Yeah. Or an Alex Raymond lookalike or something like that. You oh, know? exactly. Oh, Alex Raymond. Oh, my God. Yeah. it's. I mean, the there are so many Wallywood swipes and things mm. on things. And he they, those were open swipes, though, where it's like clearly he's doing an homage to that. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So I, I just love those old comic book covers. The one with the one of the first ones I ever saw is it's just a spaceship with two people flying in it. And there's a guy on the back of it, just pointing a huge gun right down at the dome <laughs> of the ship. And he's got this huge Viking beard kind of flowing off. And it's just such a bizarre image that even just the subject matter alone is cool enough. And then you see all the, right? the arm and the veins in the arm and this, yeah, the way he could just perfectly move it from like a muscle into some hair. And yeah, there you go. Oh my God. Yeah. I wonder if there's like a pen and ink version of that floating around. Um, That'd be cool. Huh? I think it's a Buck Rogers, right? Uh, they do. Yes, I'm pretty they certain do. it's Buck Rogers. What they you're talking about? Print at the museum, I think. Yeah, it's just ugh. everything about that. That was one where that made me almost just want to be like, I don't think I should get into comics because if this is what <laughs> people expect, like I is just going to play the drums. I think I'll just stick to that. So. <laughs> well, I mean, this. I mean, this kind of brings me back to the the Bowie reference that I met you know, that I mentioned last time. I mean, this image that we're looking at with this bearded, you know, this bearded guy with a gun on a spaceship was painted, what, I mean, 50, 60 years ago? And I think this is just a pen and ink. Yeah, it was done it right, in ink, the, man. the early, probably the late 50s, maybe. Right. I mean, 50s. I'm almost 100% certain this is like in the 50s, like 54, 56, something like that. Yeah. And it's I just, mean, yeah, the, the first time I saw it, it was just black and white pen and ink. And the colors are cool. But they, they're they they're actually pretty well done, but it just gives it such a different feel than the, uh, like Frank did everything you'd need with just the pen and ink, you know, it was really cool. I think that's a crop thing of it too or something, but that's a great crop. way. It's cool to see it in color because I, I forget how things were printed sometimes and what, how they're color, color gels really cool. and mm -hmm. color guides and all this crazy shit. So when you see them actually achieve something with it, you're like, holy shit. Yeah. It's like uh, making uh, 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 Michelangelo with a, uh, a framing hammer and uh, uh, I don't know, a stick uh, to, you know, it's just like how oh, I know. can you and achieve that with the tools that you have? You know, so and it to, doesn't make to, sense to me. To your point, uh, Justin, like what you're saying is that was done so long ago, but I think what you're trying to say is it still holds up, right? Is that where you well, Yeah, that, that, yeah. that gets back to my, you know, I, for some reason I like to compare these guys to musicians. You know, mm -hmm. it's if, if, um, it, it just doesn't, it just doesn't look dated to me, you know, in mm -hmm. the same way that a Bowie, you know, if you pop in a Bowie tune now, they don't sound, there's, there's some sort of magic there. They're so good. They're so good that they just, Maybe it's me. Maybe I've been around long enough that it doesn't seem dated. No, you could put it on the radio because, um, you know, I have the terrible radio in my car and I'll just listen to it. And you could put that out now and yep. people would love it. It would sell out. It's, just, it's a good song is a good song. So it's funny. Good that, art uh, is good art, right? Yeah, it just it holds up. And I think even if Frank was painting people, I mean, he did sometimes that were in like, you know, olden 1700s outfits or 18. It would still look modern because of the way he did it. Just what you're saying it, it looks fantastical to your point it would mm -hmm. just it invokes something in you right 
You'd, you'd have to look at it. He'd engage you. And it's you like in, in the documentary, the yep. way he put it is he said, I was looking at all these covers and then there's no one quite as dynamic and daring as Frank Frazetta, you know? <laughs> Or I think that was actually a quote from uh, a different part. It's in that same part of the documentary when they're talking about how he's first emerging and how it really, he just came out of nowhere because going from the Roman stuff, which is so stiff and boring, and then this barbarian, it's like it's just the barbarian, the way he painted was the way Conan lived. Like, there's no subtlety, you know? It's He can do subtlety, he can do softness, but there's not a lot of wishy-washy kind of indecision like it's just all there and that's what um stands out so much i think from his paintings yeah he's definitely fearless uh mm -hmm. but one of those few people that in actuality they had no reason to have fear because they're gonna rock it anyways you know uh it's just man it's just so neat seeing these prodigal guys actually use that skill to accomplish their full capacity as an artist you know their their full potential it, it feels like you know mm -hmm. people like Frizetta, they took what they had and didn't just rest on it they rocked the fucking show with it they, they mm -hmm. made every they kicked you in the chest with their work you're gonna look at my shit no you know? look at that one ah! i think that's a watercolor it looks like a watercolor it's a different yeah, yeah it's, just a, it's such a you can, you can see the comics in that still in the faces and just everything is so dynamic but then, very yeah, easy again. feeling uh you can which he did to me you see stuff so maybe you know i don't know his illustrations are a whole nother world to me even though they're still not that different than his paintings at some point mm -hmm. you know uh it's interesting to see like how he wanted to uh uh how he would make a decision. I'm sure to your point, when you say, when you see my dumb ass drawing, you're like, Oh, why did he make that? Ooh, you made that decision. Mm -hmm. Um, to see him do it. It's, it's a whole nother beast, but it's just kind of interesting how artists immediately like, how the fuck did they do that? Did they use this tool? Did they do it that way? Did, were they trained here? What, mm -hmm. you know, were they influenced by that? We just want to parse and Frank yeah. Miller is interesting like that. Go, Nick. Sorry. Oh, I just think it, sometimes I, Frazetta stuff is, it's almost pure emotion. Like this, you yep. wouldn't be able to see if somebody's really sticking someone at the bay and that like that, their eye is not going to pop out like a perfect circle like that, you know, but it, <laughs> if he just showed it in shadow the way it would be in reality with a smaller mouth and everything, basically the way the Nazi guy looks more naturalistic with his face, it wouldn't have half the impact. So Frazetta wasn't afraid to, push things and pull things a little bit to add emotion in there. Cause even in his, his oil paintings, some of the faces look way more uh, dramatic than you'd ever see in real life. But the body is so perfect and, and uh, uh, just like a model that was lit in front of him that it just works so well. So I think it's fun to see these illustrations cause they're kind of like his movie posters where they really were cartoon proportions, but they had such a uh, impact. It's fairly realistic to him. It's fantastical, but tangible at the same time. It feels like it's mm -hmm. creating a real world, yeah. but nothing you've ever seen with people you've never seen before, but they feel like people. It's really mm -hmm. magical what this guy did. He, it, it, it's so rare. So rare. It is cool, too. Like with this one, um, the Native American guy, I see N.C. Wyatt so much in the faces, and I feel <laughs> like it was a subconscious thing of just – uh, looking at Treasure Island and, and uh, Last of the Mohicans and Robin Hood and all those books that is interesting when I went to see the Frazetta Museum, um, going to the N.C. Wyeth Museum in Chatsford, the Brandywine River Museum, because you can see all the influence from Howard Pyle taught N.C. Wyeth, and they all worked in black and white at first because everything is printed in black and white, and then they started working in color. And, and just down the road a couple hours, then, um, you know, East Stroudsburg at the Frazetta Museum, which... I'm not sure what the state of everything is now, if it's moved or, um, but in 2008, that was where it was. So it, to see this really reminds me of how much of an influence N.C. Wyeth had on Frazetta's painting, where I feel like his anatomy and everything came from his imagination and his own athleticism and, you know, Hal Foster and these other artists. But then the finishing part, the textures and colors and the way he used subtle colors like that is definitely N.C. Wyeth. NC Wyeth would put bright colors in, but it's not dictating every single thing. Um, like the painting behind you. 
Ah, oh, there's yeah, a pile. Exactly. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's the one old Frisetta got uh, dinged for. Is that his so wife? gorgeous yeah. painting. But uh, uh, it's probably pretty yeah. hard to imagine a pirate ship, you know, with like all the when you're thinking you can imagine human anatomy, but to imagine the pirate ship, but still, like, look at the color he put in there and all the oof. I, I don't mean shit on him like that. No, no, I know what you're deep. saying. It's funny, it is funny. Like, sometimes oh, I mean, the ego goes a little. I wild. mean, there's not a borrowed with the best. I mean, check out this one. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't well, know. I, I can't even tell the paintings like, apart. <laughs> this is the one that he ripped up the floorboard and painted on it. Is it? You yeah. See, you can see that orange is just masonite. Basically, you can see this, the texture on it. So, I think Ellie, from what I heard, again, I I don't know. My stories might be the wrong stories now, but I heard that she was not pleased that there's like a chunk out of the floor. But maybe, <laughs> maybe that part's not true. All I know is that this is the one that he didn't have anything to paint on, so he pulled it up off the floor, and that's why it has that orange. Uh, undertone to it which is really cool yeah so i think he probably just I used... almost did a comic book based on this image oh really I, oh wow I, I quit because the writer was a doof but uh uh it's called neanderthal uh somebody got the license to like the frazetta paintings to make comic books out of each like painting uh, uh and uh it sounded like a good idea on the surface uh, and i was like shit yeah i'll do a neanderthal book and then i started working with the guy but uh uh, that being said, uh, this image will always kind of trigger that for me. Uh, it's a hell of a cool one. Oh, it's so cool. Plus, they look like me, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, well. It's nice so to see perfect. Frank uh, coming along here. I, I hope he makes it one day as an artist. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, this guy's so fucking good. <laughs> I just love it. I like head. the He's illustration just, white behind you know. him. Or the lady. Yeah, I love it. it. It's so brave. <laughs> How do you let your mind do that, dude? Uh, I think it probably is, is. This reminds me of like the watercolors where many of those have a white background. And when I'm yeah. painting in watercolor, I feel that because if you put like with oil painting, you build the form with the light. With watercolor, you build it with the shadow. So it's kind of like when you have all these nice shadows contained in this area, they're so powerful with that white background around them that if you put a background in, you're going to lose some of the, I think, the depth or power or something. You're right. The shadows. Um, but and just I think, to make that, yeah. I mean, I would have said it's this illustration background, but to your point, watercolor, I guess that's one of the reasons I was never great at watercolor is because I want to go potent right away. You know, I'm out there swinging like a big asshole. <laughs> um, where, you know, it's more, it's more of a gentle, uh, art. You gotta, it, in planning where like with oil, I can just, you know, it's big and thick like me. You can and just so keep can... painting over it and over it and over it. Exactly. You know, and just, you it physically can build up the paint, which is kind of sculpt more sculptural, which is cool. But, oh, wow. Look at that one. <laughs> That's probably the best version of the Mothman ever done. Because all the other ones just look, they're trying to make it look scary or something. That doesn't look scary, but it looks great. Like, look at that. It's intense, though. He he was smart. He just yeah. didn't have the Dracula, blah. You know, it's like. Oh, it's so beautiful. I mean, the guy pulling the girl away and the girl engaged with the, the moth. It, and then the, the lavenders. I mean, gee, mm -hmm. come on. It's just like how well, yeah, his he's, choices. He's the only artist I know that can work completely monochromatic. Well, I shouldn't say the only artist, but he's the, the best one I know that can work completely monochromatic, um, or with a complete like rainbow palette, which is so difficult to do yeah, to yeah. make any sense out of that. And it's like that's every single color in the spectrum in this painting. And I love how he stretched his arm here, and it's kind of he's got it twisted to, to rest on the branch, but it's almost unnatural. Like he would have to be inhuman to do that. It's kind of growing into the branch. It looks like, I love that. Good point, man, because it's, he's moving, not like a human would move, but he still mm -hmm. has the human form that is engaging. Yeah. And so you, you know? think like, Oh, well, I guess this is a new species now. Cause Frank does it in such a like believable way, you know, that, yeah, you know, I guess he can a, twist a his arm point. that far. Well, now that Frank drew it, it exists. So, you know, it's got to go on the zoological record. <laughs> his, uh, his favorite movie was uh, was King Kong. <laughs> oh, nice! Look at that one. Oh. Check, yeah, out that's the, great. check out that background. It it's so subtle. Sense. 
And a, and he was smart enough to put a butt in the foreground. Look at that butt too. Not like the greatest butt ever. They're all the greatest, but some are like exceptionally great. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, that one with the leg, the right leg moving forward, I would never be that brave. I could never put a dark positive shape on like he does on the right butt cheek. Mm -hmm. If the left butt cheek is shaped and has that shadow value, because then he went down to the hamstring on the left leg, mm -hmm. my brain would explode. It yeah, and it's, it's like he, yeah, it's like he had the model in front of him to be able to like move the lamp to where it's kind of in front of her, so it's starting to cast that shadow on the right butt cheek there. But yeah, like to just think of that from your imagination, I would certainly not be that brave either. Cause I'd think like, well, that's going to ruin that nice light that you've got there. Brown but, shape, right? Yeah. <laughs> but know? then it just, it just pops out the left butt cheek and makes it like the star of the show there. <laughs> so, and then you got really three old it, men sweating over it. Mm -hmm. it yeah. We're filthy assholes here. He was a little amazing <laughs> with this butt. I mean, that's, yeah, I know. that's just, Oh yes. That's just too obvious. <laughs> That's one where they like, yeah. yeah have, uh, the game is trying to try and find the game is actually try and find the uh, Frazetta painting without the butt in the <laughs> you know <laughs> front and center. Why paint? Why would you even paint? Why would you even bother picking up a pencil? Hell, like I gotta find my Ralph Bashke uh, uh, fire and ice print, but the page I bought was Tigra and her butt. It's her being carried by the uh, like Neanderthal guys, but first, like running at the camera. So to that point, uh, uh, I, I put my money where my mouth is, and that's on Frank Frazetta's butts. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted it to be more like an oil painting, even though it's watercolor. I thought, like, well, if you painted this in oil, he's going to really push that form and really have some isolated highlights there. And then I had to go back in and kind of add some little bit of brown and black to make the shadows not so washed out and stuff. So I thought the figure, I'm not super thrilled with how it came out. I like her hair, but like the, uh, the horse is, yeah, that's what I was kind of. Look at that fucking neck, to. shoulders and face, Nick, you son of a bitch. <laughs> you son of a bitch. You that, was, <laughs> that is, that is one of the most beautiful watercolor brushstrokes and gray, uh, uh, adding your gray values. I mean, I just, this is stunning, Nick. I oh, appreciate it, dude. Thank you. Oh, and Just wow, for uh, completion, we'll let everybody, by the way, guys, I use a warm light, so that's why it's washing out the, the, the greens and blues. So, not to this one, but this has a subtle violet to it that just, God, it just is fucking, you son of a bitch. Well, it is cool how the blue line kind of dictated I thought, like, well, Frank loves to do that with the green in the shadows and having things kind of fade out. So it's, you know, it, but now that you pull that away, though, and I see the texture you're putting into that rock. Oh, man. That's crazy. Oh, I love that well, so much. I'll uh, try and do, I can't do Frank, so I'm just trying to honor him by uh, burning some calories here. Because <laughs> that's all I'm capable of. All we all it. are capable of, I guess, huh? I love how you group the details together like that because then those highlighted areas just really pop out and the rock really does seem believable. It's really and that's, cool, man. That's the key when you only have two values, right? Is, mm -hmm. is finding the truth in between, you know, what? where's that gray and do I draw it or not, you know? That's what makes good inking, I think, is so many things I look back with and I either didn't do enough or went overboard or probably put a gray wash in or I should have left it alone and stuff like that. So oh, you're hard a, on your comic work. You were a natural, sir. I, oh, I know, but it just being honest, you know, it's so much fun to watch you do this. It's just, it's a, it's a, like a time machine too. If I'm going back to being like, I want to be a comic book artist, you know, <laughs> Hello, sir. Yeah, I look at all these comic book artists I follow on Instagram, and I'm just like, what was I thinking? You know. Well, we're it young. Took, so it, you know, yeah, I just had to have worked at it more. But it's just, it's a scary thing. So I salute I salute comic book artists because it's a underappreciated medium and it's a dying industry. I feel like, and I don't know if that's still the case. It's a but, dead industry. Correction, uh, uh, but uh, the medium will never die. Uh, words on pictures are going to be around for a long fucking time. So well, they were the first. So I feel like they'll be the last two. Yeah, go look at a, a cave painting. That's just language. Those are words on. Uh, or that's their expression on a, a cave wall. 
You yeah, know? I think I don't know if it was Picasso who said it. It might have been someone else. So I'm sure people will be laughing at me. But when he looked at those caves in France, he basically came out and was like, "We learned nothing," you know, like <laughs> which is like they mastered that anatomy of the bull when in a couple gestural strokes. Yeah, it's it's, it's expressive. Thirty thousand years old. Yeah, so it's like shit. They found ones even older than that, man. Yeah, you know. And Some of them, how they've like you know, used their hand and then put the ochre over it so their handprint would be on the wall. Oh, it's so just cool. It's so cool. And a lot, <laughs> it's so, it's, you know, a lot of the old old art they find that's ancient. You look at it and you think, "Yep, that looks pretty ancient." But those cave paintings in France, like that guy, could have been done or yesterday, woman or whoever whoever painted that. Yeah, they were ahead of their time because I should say drew those lines they really could hold up today, you know, and not just as like, oh, look at that stylized pretentious thing or something, but it really could hold up as something truly stylized in a beautiful way. And that's why kind of Picasso walked out of there because he's known for his, the bull drawings he did that were so stylized. And there's even those photos of him where he took the, he had that camera that would show him drawing with the light, you know, and there's some of the most beautiful animals you've ever seen. And yeah, so he probably walked in there and it's just like, oh, well, what am I going to do now? Because this person figured this out 30,000 years ago, you know? <laughs> no shit, right? <laughs> you know, he was the he was the caveman Frazetta of his time. at <laughs> <laughs> 43,000 BC Frazetta. Mm-hmm. Ripping he, off caveman uh, fence posts and uh, guys, painting themselves. Do you recognize any uh, likeness here? <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. Does that guy look like him? Look at the well, roots yeah, on the I tree, motherfucker. Yeah. I mean, it's just... <sighs> yeah, this one is my one of my favorites because he completely left all of the bottom area. Ha- kind of like... Obviously, it's finished when he says it's finished. But he left it a little bit... I don't want to say washed out because it's not washed out. But he just didn't build up the shadows quite as much. And that really pops out the cat and the figures here. And I think these two figures might be... My favorite. It's hard to pick a favorite. I know Dark King is yeah. my favorite Rosetta painting just because of it's just everything about it. But this is so this is so like 1970s too. You can just yeah. see not to date it, <laughs> but it's just got the I'm complimenting the 70s and just the round, just the way he thinks in these round forms and the stylization of the castle behind him. And there's not really much to the castle, but it's so perfect. And it's just almost the, a yeah. silhouette or a ver- reverse silhouette like the yeah, silhouette. It's, but- the negative yeah. on top of that black sky. I couldn't have not put stars in there, but it wouldn't have added to this fucking painting. Look at that yeah, rock I, on the far right side, how he goes violet, green, and then just dead brown. What the fuck, I, man? Yeah. How do you I do think, that? To your point, too, about the castle, like a lot of people would have left that maybe as just a white silhouette, or they probably would have taken the detail to where it actually meets his shoulder or something. And so just hint at it just a little bit. It's the opposite of like when people put... This is something you taught me, Zach. Like, don't just put a black silhouette. Like, put a little bit of the edge of the form in there, just a tiny bit, and then all of a sudden, easy, right? Yeah, exactly. The shadow counts then, or it didn't really count before. So. Well, it was just uh, black is potent. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's about as potent as it gets, as far as this, a drawing or illustration gets. So you got to learn how to use it, just like you do watercolor. Sometimes mm-hmm. you just got to put one edge of a shoulder or a forehead on a figure, and the human brain will just fill it in. Boop, mm-hmm. that's a person. So if you can develop that in your style, like Frank did, he's letting you finish the unimportant parts of the drawing in your brain, and you don't even know you're doing it, at least no, as a kid. You're, you're going to like it better because everyone's imagination is the king, you know? And so there's a an artist and writer uh, named Walt Morton who lives in California here. He's definitely been inspiring to um, uh, to me. And basically, a lot of times he'll do critiques. Uh, I haven't been on Facebook in a while, but he'll do little art critiques. of. And basically, one was a close-up of a painting. And the caption is like, don't finish the fucking ear. Like, leave it alone. Because uh, he had just, the artist had left it completely in shadow, but just like one kind of maroon tone just to suggest it. And it was basically that same thing of like, just leave it alone. Because if you've accomplished the form and the light and the believability of it, um, adding detail in is going to do absolutely nothing except just waste time. And it doesn't mean that photorealistic paintings aren't really impressive, but you're kind of being more impressed usually by the skill level it takes to do that and not so much the excitement of the composition or something like that. I agree. It's not as uh, 
human brain is built to see pattern. And I think part of great artists, they're able to allow, they think for the person, uh, the viewer, but they also leave a little bit of room for a person to interpret things, mm -hmm. you know, to personalize it for themselves, to make it meaningful for themselves. And sometimes hyper-realistic stuff lacks that, you know, I don't know, that open door to emotiveness, if that makes sense, to engagement. Exactly. Yeah, it's very impressive. And it's like, wow, it takes your breath away when it fools you, you know, and then that and it doesn't mean that that's not incredibly hard and cool to do. But you're right. Like it doesn't for me personally, it's not adding a lot. I just think like just take a photo if you're going to do that. And yeah. that's that'll do what you need, you know, but um, just show me paint what's not there, basically, because we can already just take a picture. That's how I feel. Anything that a Xerox machine can do, I don't want to do mm -hmm. or attempt. And yeah, and it's like I, I used to feel really bad when people would tell me that when I was doing kind of the Struisen look. They're like, you're yeah. not doing anything. You're just like copying it. And part of them was wrong because I was like, well, it's okay. So sit down and do it then. It's so easy. But then the other part <laughs> of them was correct. You know, like you need to add something into it. So um you got to leave your stink, right? Or, or otherwise, why the hell are you here? Mm -hmm. JC leaves his stink everywhere. That's his motto. Someone pointed that out about Bur <laughs> John Burns' early work is that he was so fast, you know, and he, and he penciled and he inked a lot of that, that early work. But now that they've got these artist editions out, you know, they're blowing up his artwork. And there were so many ways that he had figured out, you know, to do buildings and just give the, give the, give the hint of detail. Like, the shorthand. He really had the shorthand down for a period of time there, and um, on a on a tiny little comic book that you're reading in your hands, it looked like like he had been, you know, noodling at it for hours. And then <laughs> when you when you blow the page up and look at it at its actual size, he was just outsmarting everybody. Scritchy <laughs> pen pen work in between brushes, right? Yeah, you know that was his big move. Um, Nick, do you remember that? I guess the Star Wars poster was offered to Frazetta, but instead he ended up doing these guys, Battlestar Galactica or whatever. Oh, what? really? Oh, wow. Oh, That's no. an actual <laughs> story I read in uh, my little book I have, JC. Yeah. So I had not, no, I hadn't, I hadn't heard that one. So I, this is great. I'm, I thought I knew a lot about Frazetta, but I love this. I'm learning well, what all was the, stuff. Do today. you remember the reasoning? Like, there, like, like, I think it was like Lucas wouldn't let him keep the painting or there was some reason. It was a minor detail. I haven't read the book in 10 years, dude. So I, I'm a little rusty, but I do remember him uh, saying something about he was offered star or so, it said he was offered star Wars and turned it down. L literally. That's all I remember, sir. Well, Hilda probably didn't know anything. Like he just thought like, Oh, it's another sci-fi movie, whatever. I'll do this on instead. And this scene has <laughs> makes me think like, you know, like <laughs> you know. what, what would it would have looked like to see him paint the lightsabers and everything. It would have been so great. Chewbacca. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. For Zeta's version of Chewbacca would be terrifying. You <laughs> No, they say, they say that Chewbacca was based on a Frazetta drawing. Was oh, really? I thought it was, uh, oh, I thought I read something, but uh, that's cool, though. That's amazing. Let me look it up. There were cut, there was a, there was an interview here that I read at one point where it said, uh, if I can figure out how to spell Chewbacca. Yeah, I wonder <laughs> which, which painting it was. It's like someone staring at Frank's werewolf painting and then their oh, yeah. dog, then back at the werewolf, then back at their dog. <laughs> George Lucas is like, okay. <laughs> Yeah, there it is. Yeah, it says here, Frank Frazetta's cover art for Famous Funnies 213, which George Lucas said inspired him to create Chewbacca. Cool. Wow. I'll pop it up there in just a second because me fingers See, are slow. Here's an inter interesting thing. Uh, even while I'm doing Frazetta here uh, and kind of doing my own lines, I would never draw these long linear lines lines for texture kind of that mid-tone texture um and here we go it, i feel like i'm learning huh so when i put a line here and i hook it at the end i can now create a nice organic depth on rocks so you're going to see that in my work now or at least the exploration of it so that's why i guess i'm really liking this show and what it's about uh because he, i'm learning as an artist too you know 
Um, history, it's really interesting. History is being made, ladies and gentlemen, right in front of your face. <laughs> <laughs> that, was the gentle, that was the gentle Frazetta ghost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sorry, though. He's like the more the more compliments, the more I will guide your hand. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the ghost of Rosetta is uh, now being kind to me. <laughs> yeah, I showed here's, the proper here's, respect. Here's Chewbacca, folks. Oh, okay. Wow, I can totally. And that's one of man. That was the one where I was talking about. He did the Wally Wood uh, purpose. Yeah, he's definitely homages so. ripping off Wally Wood, but you don't even know if it's a real rip because, like him, Wally, Al Williamson. All those well, I, uh, dudes were working together, you know. I read, I read a specific interview where he talked about, and that was something I did recently, where he talked about that cover and how he's like, I even threw in a little Wally Wood there just for the show, or just for the hell of it, or something, you know. <laughs> and it's like his version of Wally Wood is so perfect, so much better than any ones except Wally Wood, you know. That just the everything about that cover, though, and even that is funny because that uh, Chewbacca inspiration is to your point, Zach, of how if you just have a little bit more than just the black silhouette, that's where his leg is stepping in there, you know. I think yeah. the kind of the cartoon eyes make it seem like, oh, this is funny, you know, or if he took those away, it would look pretty scary. Um, but yeah, it gives it power, that shadow. Yeah, most certainly, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess this whole piece is just, should be called ladies' butt because with the <laughs> negative, <laughs> Where does your eye go? To the moss? <laughs> I, and as you know, Nick, I don't really draw women like this or, you know, involve eroticism. And I mean mm -hmm. that in the, the, the best way, artistic uh, expressions of that. I don't do that very often. You know, mm -hmm. I'm used to drawing ugliness. Uh, <laughs> you know, what's inside, folks? Um <laughs> But uh, it's just really interesting. The elegance, mm -hmm. like, see, I can put in my normal hard fucking potent, you know, punch your dick blacks in. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I would never silhouette a figure like this. But just doing it, my brain, all these new neurons are firing, you know? That's very interesting. So, yeah, that's really cool. It's really cool to I'll, see that right in front of my eyes here watching it, too. Just kind of. Um, not, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh for you're being very kind, but uh, I appreciate it. But the truth. well, thank you. Uh, uh, it's just interesting because I wouldn't do this experiment on my own, but I learn so mm -hmm. much that I don't even think people really understand when I'm drawing this how much I'm learning too. You know? Uh, yeah, uh, and that was it. Was weird painting the horse. I feel like I was learning just subconsciously or something, where it's like you, I don't know how much. <laughs> Like, unlike Frank, I can't just go now and be like, no, nope, I'll paint a horse out of my head. And that's not going to work, you know. But, um, yeah, learning just about form just by thinking about what he suggests with that little bit of just pen and ink line. That horse drawing specifically has always been one of my favorites, just line-wise, because it's so open. There's really not a lot there. And I feel like at that point in 75 or 76, whenever he drew that, I think probably the mid seventies, Frazetta was at his ultimate power. Like where he was just doing I agree. just the best things you're ever gonna see. And it you know, it was just a such a highlight of his life, I think, those just those little pen and ink things that are funny because people talk about the the oil paintings, which are beautiful to see in person, but so are those pen and inks. I couldn't decide like what affected me more. There's at some point in your own mind you gotta turn yourself into a humble creature and just learn and mm -hmm. like right now i'm letting frank it's almost like uh playing jazz uh to your musical points uh uh jc look i got a master jazz guitarist here the greatest ever my job is not to outplay him or her my job is to harmonize with them and make music out of it mm -hmm. and and uh that's what i feel like i'm doing right now uh and i say that very sheepishly uh but it's just kind of neat i would have never gone down this route without this show and you got to keep an open mind because a lot of people either want to make it theirs or trace where i think mm -hmm. you learn somewhere in between mm -hmm. that's where the knowledge comes from where wow the, look, at, look at this, this one, one reminds me of the uh return of the jedi the scene on the skiff 
Oh, wow. Oh, Good yeah, job. definitely. I bet Lucas looked, well, I don't know what year this is done or whatever, but that was, yeah, because Return of the Jedi was until, what, 83 or whatever? So this yeah, is probably in his, in his head for sure. And this also, this composition is very similar to one that Frank did where it's a big, giant monster cave creature in the oh, same the kind of position as the woman is here, except with his arms up. And then there's a guy with a sword who's just about to stick it right into his heart or something. It's right at the same position that the falling sword is here. He's he's kind of holding it. And I just wish I knew the titles of these because I never remember the, I don't know if he titled them or the book publisher titled it based on like the title of the book or whatever. Um, I've always, yeah, I, I have trouble too. Like the one with the uh, guy on the boat in the turbulent green, green blue sea uh fighting like this lizard monster sticking out of the water i can never oh, yeah. remember the name of that but it's one of the greatest drawings i've ever seen in my fucking life oh so just this one's definitely called the mucker <laughs> <laughs> oh my god and then you wonder like, what was the book about because it's I don't it know. doesn't matter it's, he's got he's holding the butt yeah. yeah the book's about doing coke as a writer um <laughs> yeah exactly uh but you get a Frazetta painting for it. <laughs> it's great. Look at that. Talk about the bell bottoms too. Well, that's... <laughs> so that's the best in the like the the Clint Eastwood painting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think he probably loved that too because it just it works towards that pyramid composition. It grounds the figure with those big like Clydesdales or something, right? They have Gives the fur big, at the bottom. Yeah, big big, op big open shape to play with in any way mm -hmm. you want, right? Yeah, you and know. if you think about when Frank was painting and drawing, is you know when Hollywood was actually making new things, and so they're new. And I feel like nowadays is the the we're in the world of just recycle, just use the Dukes of Hazard Seven. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's like, like okay. no wonder, no wonder artists also feel that because everybody in society is like, don't take a chance, don't ever take a chance, because you know we. It's what you're taught in school. Ass, so. Don't and, achieve. Sit in your chair. Learn how to be a banker. Yeah, pretty much. So it's nice when you get a teacher or someone who's like, look, I'm here to tell you that, but we all know that like you got to do what you want to do. So it's a nice thing to, oh. to hear occasionally from people. This is intimidating, but I can kind of turn off that scared ego, you know, that, that voice, mm -hmm. Nick, that's always telling me you can't do this, dumbass. Who are you fooling? Um, yeah, no, that's a really good point. I think that that's one of the best things from this podcast, I think, is that, yeah, you can kind of, because we're so hard on ourselves as artists that if you're making up the form and then you're trying to ink it too, you're still at the inking point, probably questioning, like, is this the right form? Is this the right way to draw this thing? Like, should I have done it that? And with Frank, you just know, like, it's perfect. So just kind of, just yeah, let you can let somebody you. else drive for a minute, you know? <laughs> Again, it's like playing jazz. I'm not the lead rhythm mm -hmm. guitarist or whatever. I'm, I'm the asshole playing key keyboard in the back with a grin on his face, staring at the, the actual stud, you know? Yeah. Like, well, to back to the people I was emulating in illustration, like when I was trying to drew, do Drew Struzan's style, obviously I got to the point where I'm like, well, he has the real magic with that. But I did learn so much just trying to get to that point of how to apply paint and like how to use use an airbrush, how to paint opaquely with acrylics, how to use oil paint, like I, just to try to look like that. I thought like, well, I got it. And so even after I stopped trying to emulate it, um, you know, a lot of, because a lot of the artists now work digitally and it's just so much faster and I'm just not, I'm not that great d d digital painting. I'd have to really work on that, but it was just all the stuff I learned just trying to do that other style. So it's cool that to see you actually doing that right here in front of my eyes, like picking up, little techniques and things in your mind that you're doing it, but it's because of his suggestion underneath there that's making you yeah. take that chance. So it's cool. Yeah. And this is always the problem I had with inkers to, uh, to uh, dovetail that in another point. Uh, inkers that just trace, they're always going to be inferior because they don't really understand what the artist is even attempting. Mm -hmm. Not really. And in my my limited capacity, I at least ink and draw so I can kind of like, okay, Frank kind of wants this here and mm -hmm. I know how to draw a rock. So I'll find a happy medium between our two styles, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, I always, liked always work, comics. <laughs> but it, I, I always liked how uh, I think it was Kevin Nolan. Is that his name? Ooh, how he did that's it. it. 
Yeah, because he really drew. Like, the he Renaissance really these man. Dark shadows and some scary shadows that would be really impossible to do if you didn't understand how to draw and you didn't understand white. And so he can really, when you get him to, if somebody gets him to ink something, I know he draws really well, you know, but it's like I've seen him ink things too, where it's like, God, that looks like Kevin Nolan drew that just from what he finishes it. Um, you know, uh, he's a very. Him inking Garcia yeah. Lopez or. Then he'll link mm -hmm. Mike Mignola. Could they be two different artists? You know, my Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the true mastery of his understanding of the tools, the art form, uh, mm -hmm. and being confident enough in his expression to be part of the artist's journey, at least in that piece. You know? Yeah, I mean, he really inspired me, too, to not worry so much about, like, the perfect feathering on inks and stuff because he just uses those flat lines but he just cross hatches into that form and it's like the cross hatching and getting them closer and closer together that does it so it's just another option where otherwise you have to feather those lines you have to use a brush and a pen and all these different tools which is great but i just loved how you know it, it seemed like oh i could not that i could do that it's not that was not my thought but i thought like oh that makes sense to me whereas other things it was just kind of a mystery so I appreciate well, it. Builds algebra yeah. in your brain, kind of. Mm -hmm. Those artists that kind of like, okay, I un I I can parse it and kind of under. I can't do what they do, but I can understand what they're doing and kind of why they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Which once you have that in your head, you can. It it adds firepower to your own work and thoughts. I would say because you watch somebody mm -hmm. else explore and succeed, and you can take that and apply it to your own life. Digest yeah. it yours you know your and journey like in the documentary when i mean the it's so sad that he's not here anymore but bernie wrightson talk about a master but he was <laughs> saying like i don't know if i could have pulled that out of my mind but he's like there's the man doing it there's frisetta doing it so like i right, guess i'll try to do it and it's like wow i'm so glad that happened you know we wouldn't have frankenstein otherwise and we wouldn't have you know oh, just yes. we just the have the novel but his illustrations make that novel just so much richer and everything because it really looks like something that was done back in the time when that's taking place. Um, the way he it's did all the work, and, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, the best. So I loved hearing that. You know, it's that makes me feel like okay, just it's allowed. You're allowed to be a human being. Like you can admit that. Yeah, I can't do this on my own, but it's okay. You know? Yeah, you don't start at the top of the mountain. You start at mm -hmm. the bottom going, I can get to the top of that mountain. I can climb. I don't know yeah. the path I'm going to take, but if there's a boulder in my way, well, I'll just get around the boulder and then I keep climbing. If the uh, river, yeah. river's washed and out, it, you got to find a new path, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think like the, it's tough because sometimes inspiration can also be like, of the opposite where you think like, well, I'll never be able to, there's a funny commercial where it's all these different artists looking at the reference and being like, I'll never be able to paint like them. I'll never be able to, <laughs> she's like, I'll never be able to paint. And then it's a caveman. He's just like, I'm the best. What are you looking at? You know, nothing. My caveman shit don't stink. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's great, Crumb. dude. It just makes me think of, it's just all Arnold just be crumb. All channeled through Chrome. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Co up the artist school. What are you doing? <laughs> Who Why are you? you? Yeah. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Nick, Dan a wolf. Going back <laughs> to what you what you mentioned about the Picasso quote and how mm -hmm. they had it all figured out with the fewest lines. You know, oh, he drew mm -hmm. a buffalo in three lines. They figured it out. You know, mm -hmm. we're all wasting our time. But it brings we did a we did a Frank Miller episode not too long ago. We were we were looking at his um, his work on uh, Sin City, mm -hmm. and it kind of you know I I hold Miller in the same esteem I hold you know Frazetta or Kirby or, or I agree or any of these guys. But it's he, he's kind of a funny case, and there are guys like that who are you know these sort of pure cartoonists who don't draw as well as Frazetta or Mobius or, you know, Busema for that matter, or any of these guys, or even Nick Zek. Um, but, um, <laughs> Zek's probably a better artist than Frank Miller. But, um, well, that's the thing is an artist, that's an abstract word. They're, they're all great artists, so it's hard to say who's best. It's who's, you can say who can do certain things better but then the other person when frank miller's on he writes 
and draws stories that mm-hmm. kind of just grab you by your neck and drag you along for the rest of the day. It's, right. it's yeah. So- I mean, I think like, <laughs> to jump in with Frank Miller is he, it's almost like he just had to, to find that style where it's like all the daredevil stuff he did was all linear, you know, it was lines. And then to take away the lines almost completely, I know there are pages in Sin City where it all is lines, like in the beginning and stuff, but mostly it's only shadows. So I remember seeing that, at like 10 or 12 when my older stepbrother let me just have his comics to take care of them basically I was reading preacher and all these crazy comics and um just came across in city and it was just like a nuclear bomb because i thought like you don't need the lines you don't even need them all you need are the shadows and you can tell an entire story with that and i think that nobody paints in just or draws in just shadows better than frank miller but then yeah if you talk about other things well his uh it's wonky you know so (laughs) I do want to put in, and he even admits to it, a heavy mm-hmm. Kniff influence. And if you look ah, at okay. some of Kniff's stuff, it got very graphic. Like you can see where mm-hmm. Frank learned from it, not copy, sure. but learned from it. You know, so there it was, didn't come from a void. Uh, mm-hmm. Came from Milton Kniff. Oh, cool. um, yeah. See, to me, it was just like I just saw Sin City and thought, like, oh, he invented this. You know. <laughs> so again, yeah. it's good to good to hear. Well, he story. did, but. It, it, by that time, he was his own voice, uh, and it, he did invent it. Um, but in that style, isn't Kniff? Just like if you look at, uh, I get what you're saying though. He saw something in that, and it thought like, "Oh, that's a way to think about it." Just the way when I saw Sin City, you know, this is before I looked back and saw and even know who Frank Miller was. All I knew is that the guy who wrote and drew this did something different in my, you know, ten year old mind or whatever. Um, so it is really cool to hear who he was inspired by. Well, he, he has several, but and I mm-hmm. I wanted to get back to. But the thing is, he he found his own voice by learning from greatness rather than just copying greatness. Um, and uh, I think all the greats eventually do that. Uh, but uh, uh, one thing uh, going to your point with just the fewest amount of lines, that was Toth, one of my all time favorites. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and pound for pound, maybe the the greatest comic book artist ever, in my opinion, him and Mobius. But uh, he, he his whole thing was know what all the lines, all the art, what it looks like finished, and then reduce it to its basic mm-hmm. shapes for readability. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously in his times, worse printers, and he developed his own philosophy i mean that's a very common philosophy and illustration and he was the true i mean he was king shit on fuck mountain of of that mm-hmm. philosophy so uh yeah it's kind of interesting to your point where illustration i'm kind of an anti-philosophy but i still have the same grounding roots you can see how i set up shadows like mignola and frank miller still to ground my hyper detail elements which ne- neither of them have so even mm-hmm. though I'm not doing what they do, their successes taught me how to make my own voice. So oh, look at that. <sighs> look at the yellow on the stomach of the uh, tiger. Oh, I know. Fuck how you. He just, he just you, Frank. put it on there. Yeah, he just like took cadmium yellow and just slapped it on there, and it was probably going to blend it. And it was like, nah. Do you know what this means? <laughs> Out of the tube, yellow. <laughs> Out of the tube. <laughs> probably. It probably was. I've seen the footage of him, you know, and he has that giant just mountain of oil paint that he just kind of goes back to. <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah, it's something else, man. I love on this painting, too, how her arm is so detailed and it's kind of, <laughs> it's more in shadow. So he's kind of allowing more of these browns and kind of purple in there. And then again, the butt is just like the highlight of the painting. And, yeah, All she does looks. is deadlifts. She's yeah. queen of the dead, jungle deadlifts. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> With a little help from mom and dad's jeans. <laughs> Tell me when to put a fork in this uh, JC and I'll uh, uh, put the final touches on. Uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll do it by myself and then, uh, and then uh, show it online. Or we yeah. can edit it in at the end. Let's uh, let's call it a day. We'll put it up on the site. Nick, it has been a super super pleasure having you here. I uh, I have really enjoyed your your commentary and your artwork has has really just blown my mind. You're fantastic, Zach. Of course, as always, you've made it your own, and it's awesome. Thank you guys so much for having me. It's, yeah, it's really been this has been exciting. Um, it's the first podcast like this that I've done, so it honor uh, truly an honor I think Zach and I've had quite a long journey together so it's cool to kind of talk about that a little bit 
Yeah, uh, we'll have to tell a story how we met and some of our uh, fun adventures because we've been on a few together. So uh, <laughs> if we ever have you on as a guest again, we'll uh, we'll uh, talk about how dumb and rowdy we used to be. <laughs> how we sh probably shouldn't be alive. Um, but Nick, I love you. Thank you so much for being on this show. You're one of the you, uh, most inspirational artists I've ever met in my life. Uh, it's been fun watching your journey. Uh, and I can't be more proud to say you're my friend, dude. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much, Zach. Thank you for coming to the Blacklist Underground. We will see you again next week with who knows. We'll find out soon. Take it easy, guys. Take care. See you guys. Bye. <laughs>